Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 200 Boxing Asylum No Terrors podcast. I'm your host, Steve Wellings, and joining me this evening so far, we have Andy Patterson, Dave the Hater Lowback, and Donny Baseball. We're going to get straight to it, guys, this week uh, over in the Inglewood uh, Forum in California, where Bernard Hopkins bowed out a long and magnanimous career, but he was knocked out by Joe Smith Jr. for the WBC International Light Heavyweight title. For old B-Hop, unfortunately, he's nearly 52. It's about time he hung them up, but he's been a great servant of the sport, a master of the dark arts himself. It was by a few dark arts in his eyes that he ended up uh, finishing his career. I didn't think there was too much wrong, to be honest, with Joe Smith Jr.'s four or five punch combination at the end. But Mr. B-Hop thought that he'd been pushed out of the ring. The replays show pretty conclusively as far as I'm concerned. I don't know what the guys think. We'll get to them soon. But I didn't think there was any foul play at all. I think Joe Smith showed he was stronger, younger, fresher, and he punched too hard. For the old man B-Hop, no doubt Hopkins would have chewed him up and spat him out in his prime, but he's long since removed from his prime, and even this remarkable man had to uh, come come out of the sport at some point. Donny, I was a little bit worried, actually, for Bernard at the end, whenever he, th- he flew through those ropes, and he-, he felt as if he'd maybe damaged his spine or smashed his head or something. Were you concerned initially for him? Well, yeah, for like a, about a second, but then he, he popped right back up. Um, and uh, when it was clear, because he was talking when he was on the ground, and I was like, I was actually yelling. I was like, don't don't assist him. You know, don't don't pick him up uh, because you're not really allowed to do that. Although I think they would have, if somebody maybe gave him a hand to his feet, <clears throat> they probably would have let him go on. But he just didn't, uh, he wasn't interested in getting back in the ring. I don't know if he was, aware. I mean, he had to be aware of the 22nd rule if he's been around boxing this long. Um but, uh, but I mean, you know, he, he, he was uh, complaining about his uh, ankles that he couldn't walk on it. Um, don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm sure that there has to be some truth to that. I mean, he was in the fight. I think he would, if he could have continued, he would have. But, uh, yeah, he landed right on his head. It was pretty ugly. Uh, and, you know, it was in, in some ways, you know, you don't want to see a guy go out like that. But in, in another way, it's a very Hopkins-like ending, isn't it? Uh, you know, um, there's always there's always like some sort of weird shit that, you know, like remember the first Dawson fight or uh, even when he beat Roy Jones, he was saying that the back he, that Roy Jones did in the back of his head so much that uh, he thought he needed to go to the hospital. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, there's been always there's always some um, some sort of strange kind of thing that always seems to happen, you know, every every five or six Hopkins fights. And this one is uh, no different. Um, but, uh, but I mean, you know, he was in the fight. I had it about, uh, I either had it five, th- five, two or four, three for Smith, uh, uh, near the end there. Um, and, uh, you know, it was about four clear rounds for Smith, about two clear rounds for Hopkins, one swing round. Uh, so he was in the fight. Uh, but you know, like I said, last week, I said, this is going to be, you know, Hopkins veteran, uh, you know, grit and, uh, and all of his, uh, all of his tricks and his counter punching and his boxing and his movement. Uh, versus a guy who likes to come forward and is going to, you know, uh, throw a high volume of punches and can really hit hard. And, uh, you know, in the end, youth won. Uh, but uh, there's no shame in that for Hopkins. It was a, a great career for him. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do a kind of career retrospective or not. Uh, but just on the, the fight itself, um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was an exciting fight and it had an exciting ending. Andy, last week we all made our picks and spoke about how we thought the fight would go. I went for B-Hop. I thought he'd just have that one last big performance in him against Calibre. He'd be able to outbox him and outsmart him. It was a case, I think, of just being active, using his strength, hitting anything, arms, gloves, elbows, shoulders. And he pretty much did that. I thought his game plan was, was quite good and it was quite effective. Up until the point of the stoppage, Andy, how did you think Smith was go, uh, getting on? Did you have it pretty close or, or did you think B-Hop was doing enough? What did you say? I, th- I thought Smith was in front of me by a couple of points. Um, I think probably the, the key point was that he actually he hurt uh, Hopkins pretty early in the fight. I think it was a right hand and maybe then caught him a left hook. And kind, of st- well, kind of dipped him a wee bit. So Hopkins was obviously kind of wary of that. I mean, he looked every age, uh, sorry, every every part of the 52-year-old he was last night. Um, resistance gone. He's been in the ring for two years. Uh, as, as Donnie said, I probably agree with what Donnie said there, actually. You know, was every other couple of fights with Hopkins, you always get some sort of kind of controversy. Um, you know, it's been, it's been a great career, but he's he's obviously you know coming up. He's been, he's been a, a good fighter. He's become an all time great or whatever. But uh, he's also had his he's had his stinkers. He's had, he's had his bad moments and he's had his his moments as well with cherry picks and stuff. I know some people can kind of look at his later career because he's 
advanced in age that he's been cherry picking his, uh, his opponents. But, you know, some of these guys are kind of mixed at the top level. So we can't kind of be too harsh on him. I mean, I think that the way he schooled Pascal, mainly in that second fight, uh, basically kind of cemented his legacy as like one of the all time greats. But, um, you know, what can you do? He's, he's, just, he's probably been narcissistic. You know, he wanted to come back one last throw of the dice and I just wanted to see where he was at. But, you know, I would probably agree with some people when they say as well, you know, he took on a, a harder opponent, I suppose, compared to some of these PBC fighters. Look at Danny Garcia, for instance, when I go back to Rod Salka. But, uh, you know, we can, we can, you know, wax lyrical about, about Hopkins at the same time, but, you know, you can also go to Geese Smith a lot of credit as well. I know some people are kind of saying that he should be in a shout for fight of the year or so, but uh, this we'll discuss that later on. Um, he went in there, but did, did what he had to do, and uh, he, he done the business. Um, so you can do to ask the boy. And uh, what opens up for him next, I would, I would hope so, and anyway, he gets a, a top fight on HBO. Yeah, hopefully so, Andy. You're a connoisseur of the uh, historical side of boxing. Just before we bring Dave the Hater Low back in there, uh, Ian Pybus asked us a question on Twitter, Andy. He said, where does Hopkins rank in the all-time great middleweights? I suppose we're throwing in names like your Haglers, your Carlos Monzons, your Benvenutis, all these type of guys. Where, where would you put him pretty much up there? Or? Uh, top five, probably, mate. Um, Monzo and Hagler, I suppose, are, are probably kind of bona fide top two. But uh, yeah, I would say I would say probably top five definite for for uh, Bernard Hopkins. Um, he was, I'm just trying to think his middleweight career now actually. Uh, as I say, I, I know he had like that three fight series with Robert Allen. There were a bit of controversy, and I think it was a second fight. I think it was. I think there might have been some sort of. I think that might involve that actual Hopkins getting pushed at the ring. Actually, I believe. Um, yep, it did. did, yeah, it did. It, am I right in saying that? Time. Yeah. So this is not the first time. Yeah. Well, I did. I, I mentioned. I said that last night. Actually, you know. I, I, He's looking for an excuse here. He always looks for an excuse or someone to blame. It's like the, the establishment was always against them type of thing. Or um... no, be, be real though, he didn't. He 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 accepted the uh, the Sergey loss with uh, with some grace, which was nice. because uh, uh, he knew he was he was he was soundly beaten in that fight. But if you look at, <coughs> and I, I, I accept that the the sun's going to rise in the east tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> well, like, he, I mean, what else? What other choice did he have? <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he, he just saw that uh, last night. Actually, you know, basically complaining about an ankle injury. I mean, unless he's actually went, rolled his ankle either before the fight, he's got it heavily strapped up, or he's tweaked something during it when he's been moving about the ring and stuff. He never injured that ankle going out the ring, and that was just classic Hopkins there last night after that fight, complaining about an injury and stuff. He, he complained about the judges, about the politics, about Kalzagi and all that sort of stuff. Couldn't really complain about Kovalev because he was well beaten. Um, I think even I think I might even heard Hopkins say after fighting that he, he was like he was pushed to the ring. It was I think it was a, a left hook he took, and then he was at that point I think he was well stunned by the NA and obviously landed on top of his head. It's not really going to help him, I suppose. But uh, he was looking for excuses there last night. Maybe it was maybe it was because he was concussed. Maybe no, but who knows? It's just typical Hopkins. Though. He's always looking for an excuse. He's a proud man, and and that's who he is. I don't think at fifty one years old, I don't think we're ever going to be seeing. A humble Hopkins, although he was humble after Sergey, he has a lot of respect for uh, the Crusher. Um, I don't think it was like a knockout last night. I think it was probably might have been a knockdown, and it happened to be that he was knocked down through the ropes. Um, absolutely bizarre ending in a bizarre career for a, a bizarre, but also a unique and amazing uh, human being. Um, take the bad with the good. It's not a great ending for him. Um, I hope it is the end. I hope he does not come back. I know he probably, part of him wants to um, not go out that way. But I hope this is the end. Um, he's had, he's done so much through his career, and uh, you can't just keep, you can't keep upsetting the odds. I mean, he, way back, way back during the, the very first Pascal fight, people thought he was done. He got dropped early, and everyone's like, well, that's the end for Hopkins. And then, of course, he worked his way back into that fight and uh, ended up uh, pr arguably winning it, getting the draw. A lot of people thought he won. Then, of course, getting the rematch, and he won, became lineal he light heavyweight champion again. It's, I mean, you could talk about Hopkins' career for hours. Um, not always been bright lights. There have been dark shadows as well. But uh, it, it's, been a, it's been an entertaining one for me. Um, and I have nothing but respect for the guy. So I hope he, hope he, hope he's done here. And, um, as for Joe Smith, I mean, he's the winner here, so we got to talk about him too. Um, he fought well against a guy who had absurdly high levels of experience. So he proved maybe that Fun Faro win wasn't just a fluke. Um, he got a legal stoppage 
of Hopkins who'd never been stopped before. Um, I don't think there's anything controversial about, about the way they ruled it. It was a TKO. Uh, it was a legal blow. He fell out of the ring, injured himself or not injured himself, whatever. He, he didn't continue. So uh, Joe Smith has the legal stoppage win over Hopkins, and uh, that's, that's big for him. So I'm sure the pedophile, child molester, coward will avoid him now. And I'm speaking, of course, of Adonis Stevenson. Yeah, thanks, thanks for clarifying that, Dave, who you were speaking about there. Um, let me ask you a question here. Let me preface this question from Liam Wynn with one of my own. Do you think Hopkins went on too long, yes or no, uh, till, till he retired? Should he have retired earlier? Um, I think mm, before the fight happened, I was thinking he was probably going to win it. So... I would say this. I would, from his perspective, I can see why he why he did that, why he took this fight, because it's uh, he wants to go out on a win, um, get a get a, a top ten win at over fifty years old, just make some more history again, and it would have been uh, quite a quite a night if he had done it. So, but he didn't in this case. So I, hindsight's twenty twenty. You can say, yeah, he probably should have just stayed gone, just saved himself a few punches. But uh, ahead of the fight, I wouldn't have said so. Well, that's from his perspective, but from your perspective, as Liam Wynn asks, ideally, after what fight do you think Hopkins should have called it a day? After which win do you think he should have hung the gloves up? Hmm. I would, I would, I would probably go for after uh, after a second Pascal fight. I mean, lineal title, unified champ, or whatever it was. I knew there was a few other trinkets in the line and stuff. It was probably them was probably the ideal time to walk away. Yeah, um, that that, that was probably, that was certainly his highest moment in in his later career. Or but if you I want to argue, but you could probably say Shumanov because that was when he, he get, again unified the title again. Eh? But he yeah, yeah. walked away then. But I, I would probably go with Pascal. I did enjoy that Marat fight though. That was that was really entertaining. That was after the Pascal fight. But well, whatever. I mean, yeah. I, I enjoyed Cloud uh, Marat and Shumanov. Um, you know, I mean, he had a he had a run of three straight good wins there against uh, you know top ten guys at uh, while he was pushing fifty. Uh, those, that was an impressive run. I mean, uh, I mean, I think that honestly, I think that uh, you could. I mean, this is a stupid question, really, anyways. But I mean, you know, uh, I would say yeah. After the Kovalev fight, it was clear that the torch had been passed to uh, a new generation of light heavyweight, uh, and that you know that Kovalev was the man. I don't think he really had anything left to prove, but I can understand why he wants to come back and get a win. But he didn't want to just get any win. He could have picked some you know, schlub off the street, but he didn't, you know, he picked the top 10 guy and he lost. And that's what happens when you're 52. Um, but I think that, I think that if he stops now that he'll have stopped at the proper time uh, for him. Yeah. It was like a sentimental thing, wasn't it, Donnie? I think he would have been obviously delighted with beating Smith because he saw him as very beatable, but I think he wanted to go out on a note that not a controversial note, but he, I think he would have been happy even maybe going the distance and losing like a, a like slightly controversial split decision. I think he was set up for a defeat, but just not set up for that kind of defeat. Yeah, I think that's correct. Yeah. One thing, and, though, one yeah, thing yeah. About, about Joe Smith, actually, I mean, you're talking about, uh, you know, well, Dave was talking about the Donny Stevenson. He is. I think he's still, I think he's ranked with other bodies and that as well. So obviously he's going to probably going to be waiting for a title shot. So, you know, he seems to have he seems to have have a dig about him, right? Van Farah is obviously you know class is a kind of okay fighter. Hopkins is old and that, but if that guy's power is is what we think it could be, you know, I would love to see him in my top ten guy, uh, you know, in his next fight. Because obviously the the world title fight is not going to happen anytime soon. So uh, I don't know, maybe likes a guy like uh, I don't know Marcus Brown possibly. Scoglund, I don't know if he would take the fight. Um, Terry, I think he's fighting next week, so that that one's out for uh, well, yeah, you can but maybe make that one next year. Yeah, but Turgio's fighting next week. Can anybody remember? I th could have sworn when he fought Fonfara for some reason that he was a Southpaw, but when he came out orthodox, I was really confused. Am I just getting that wrong? <laughs> and maybe he doesn't know the difference. Uh, <laughs> his post-fight interview seemed a little bit squat, uh, Scott Scott Quigg level. Um, he's like, yeah, I, I, saw he was, I saw he was dropping his left hand, so I threw my right hand. And you know, he, did, he sounded like a, a bit of a simple guy, but uh, I, I still like him. 
but we like simple guys on here. Uh, just before we go on to having a, a brief look over Bernard's career, and I want each of you to tell me your highlights, really, and what you've enjoyed. I know a couple of the guys have touched on it, but just before, and I'm just, I've made up a little list today of people falling out of the ring. It doesn't happen very often, but we mentioned the Hopkins-Allen fight there. I remember Oleg Maskoyev once yeah. knocked out Hasim Rachman, and Steve Schmoger ended up with a, a flying chair on his head in the melee afterwards <laughs> at ringside. Uh, also, Gerald McClellan knocked Nigel Ben through the ropes. Obviously, not a knockout, but he definitely went through. Rocky Marciano and Joe Lewis, as uh, Max Kellerman mentioned. Paul Williams, I want to say the Kermit Simtron fight. I can't remember exactly which fight. Paul Williams knocked somebody out of the ring. And finally, I've mentioned this one before. Randall Bailey against Zaid Uwali, 2010. Oh, Bailey picked up Uwali onto his shoulders and booked him over the top rope, and it ended up as a no no Royal decision Rumble. or a no contest. Can you think of any others, Andy? I there's one I, I don't know the names of it, but it's it's been running about Twitter for ages on YouTube. Like you usually see it getting uh, posted for time to time. There's a guy he's getting his arse kicked and he runs across the ring and tries to jump out the fucking ring, but he gets caught in the ropes. <laughs> and the guy just runs up to him and punches him right out of the top rope. <laughs> I believe that guy's <laughs> name was Jerry Hackney. Jerry uh, Hackney. I, I, can't, I think his last name was Hackney. I, I'm not sure about his first name, but yeah, Hackney. And he's like, I, I, I would hate for people to, to start calling that, getting knocked out of the ropes, calling getting hackneyed. Well, yeah, I don't think anybody <laughs> remembers that guy well enough to call it that. The other one probably be Golovkin against the Shida. Remember, he just he knocked him out, but he actually had the, yes. the it had well, he had the, the grace of mind actually. You know, the, the the kind human being that he has actually punched him out through the top of the bottom rope, right in front of the doctor's fucking table. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was also a, a member of that guy. Uh, he hasn't. I don't know if he's fought since uh, since he took that bad loss there, but Amir Imam. Yes. Um, he knocked some guy out of the ring, I think, about last year, the year before. And, uh, yeah, just to – I mean, the guy, like, fell straight on his head. Uh, and he actually got up and made it back in the ring by the 20 count. But, um, but yeah, but I guess the ref didn't want to let it go on. Um, and uh, what else was I going to say? Uh, there was one other one. We, we, we did uh, Dempsey Furpo, right? No, no, I touched on that one, mate. Well, that's a good one. Good. That's a yeah. good one. Remember, uh, what about uh, Penal Whitaker against that? Uh, is, it, is it Hurtado? Oh, yes, Hurtado. I forgot about that one. That's was, right. Uh, yeah. was, was Joe Lewis knocked out of the ring by Marciano? Marciano. Mm. I, I actually just looked it up. It was Mr. Jerry Hackney. And if you look him up on Box Rec, you can see the gif of <laughs> him getting knocked off the ropes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, B Hot moments. I was only becoming a hardcore back in around 2000. I was a casual before then. And I remember the Boxing Monthly whenever Hopkins fought Trinidad and all the fuss behind before it, throwing down the Puerto Rican flag. And Hopkins was the master of the mind games. But that was really his breakout performance. And I'm going to say that that was my favorite Hopkins moment. As close as the Morad Hakar fight comes to it or the Herod Eastman bout, I'm going to go with Hopkins Trinidad. Hopkins put an absolute schooling on Trinidad that night. He negated his power. He showed brilliant boxing, patient, excellent footwork, and he stopped him in the 12th round. That's my favourite moment, Andy. Your favourite Bernard moment? Oh, I tend to be cheeky, mate. I've, uh, over the course of the last couple of months, I've just been kind of gradually working through his early career and that. So if you actually want to get any of the listeners, want to know if they've ever seen him back in that time, he's actually quite exciting to watch. He was like, you know, bring it forward into the, into the trenches, so to speak. Uh, but obviously, as they went up in competition, they had to kind of basically change it up a wee bit. But, uh, yeah, this I'm trying to think. The Mercado fight was very good, wasn't it? Uh, what one was that, mate? The Mercado Mar fight, wasn't it in Venezuela or somewhere? Ah, that was when it ended a draw, but uh, he faced a guy early in his career called uh, is it Jovan Mercado. That was that was uh, some fight, actually. That was a good one. That was his, I think it was his fifth pro fight. Go back and watch that one. That's on YouTube. Okay. Um the I'm trying to think the new. I, I don't mean betrayed. I'd obviously he was a bit underdog in that fight as well. But I, I would probably need to go with maybe see the see the the Tarver one and the the Pavlik ones. Those were really good ones because I think he was also the bit underdog. I know for that fight in that Tarver fight. I think he was three to one underdog in that fight also. Uh, it was just basically the, the way he took uh, Kevin Pavlik apart. I mean, obviously he was undefeated at that time, thirty-four. No, I think the fight was at a catch weight. So I mean, I mean the, the guy at that point was basically he was just he was going through everybody at that time. You know, obviously you know the middleweight division wasn't all that all that great at the time. You know, he fought Taylor twice. You know, badly beat him up in that in that, in that first fight. Knocked out basically at that point probably maybe a peak Edison Miranda. You know, Gary Lockett obviously was was nothing, nothing great, but in that fight uh, against Hopkins, I just thought it was uh, absolute school, and I think that was one of his best performances ever. 
I'd Philly forgotten Pavlik all about the Tarver fight. Yeah, I'd forgotten all about the Tarver fight, Donny. Um, that's just another one to add to the record. Which one do you like? Yeah, I like the Pavlik one too, because uh, what was he was he was forty two or something then, and you know people were like, oh yeah, you know he's he's too old, he, he's done. A three or four to one underdog, and then. You know, I mean, to think that, that that that's 10 years ago and he was still, you know, he still was beating top 10 guys, uh, you know, in the division going into this fight. I mean, that's just that's just absolutely crazy. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I thought that uh, I thought that that Pavlik win because it was so unexpected and just of the, the clinical way in which he just used boxing skill to, to just take apart a younger champion, uh, I thought was uh, was amazing. Uh, and I could watch that fight over and over again because uh you know, it never ceases to amaze me. He sent he sent Pavlik to the ball a while one week in that fight. Yeah, I mean, it ruined his career. I really did. I mean, you know, and and Hopkins uh, has a history of, of doing that. Uh, you know, um, some guys fight him, and then they just they seemingly don't. They, they lose some sort of uh, measure of self confidence in there, whatever it is. Uh, but uh, there have been many an opponent who have uh, been picked apart by Hopkins, only to you know never climb to the same heights again. Hey, to Dave, what about you? I know you're a big fan, so you don't have to stop at just one. My favorite Hopkins fight. Um, probably the Calzaghi schooling. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> no, um, I, it, yeah, I would agree with Steve, what he said earlier. The, 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 the Trinidad comprehensive beatdown. I mean, that's kind of my ideal boxing performance. You just outclass him, take what he has, and, uh, and stop him late. Dave, I saw By the way, is it yeah. is it lost? Plus, I never liked last Trinidad night. either. Trinidad was a cocky pos. He was annoying, and his fans were annoying too. So I'm glad he got knocked out. Can I? Uh, <laughs> can I just ask two yes. questions? Oh, sorry. Yes. Well, first yes. of all, I don't know uh, why John David Jackson was his trainer last night and not Nazim Richardson. That was a little bit strange. Uh, but second of all, uh, <laughs> I was also uh, thinking to myself. I was like, isn't it ironic that 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 Bernard Hopkins? Knocked out John David Jackson in 1997, <laughs> and then he was yeah. he was his trainer last night. I thought that was. Uh, and then and then he knocked out Glenn Johnson. I think it was only, I think it would be the second. I would, I would definitely the first knockout defeat of Glenn Johnson's career for until he could beat off uh, Macabu. Yeah, and also yeah. I believe he turned pro before Joe Smith was even born. Hi, I mean how many decades did they fight in? Uh, Ronald Reagan was Smith president was in when, uh, when, when Hopkins started. Yeah. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> some man definitely some man Bernard you'll be missed um, you didn't I don't think I saw on Twitter I think the guy was trolling he said something about Hopkins went on too long and he tarnished his legacy by, like Roy Jones but I, I don't think there's any comparison on legacy personally Hopkins was still fighting and competing with the best whereas Jones has had a steady and all of a sudden a rapid decline I don't think there's any comparisons I know what you mean I, I wouldn't agree with you with the best mate what I'll probably say is probably guys who are ranked in the top 10 as such you know mm. for yeah. that's worth really but obviously I mean if you look at what Jones has been fighting I mean obviously he's, he's fought like a Lebedev and got absolutely bad, badly knocked out but uh, I know what you mean. It's, uh, there's no comparison, really. But you know, at any day, even when Roy Jones decides to retire, you know his legacy is attached as well. I mean, what what actually he does now shouldn't really fucking negate what actually went before him. You know, he was a great champion back in his time, and that can't be forgotten. It can't be forgotten. George said on the Twitter earlier, has Joe Smith Jr. had a better year than all the Smith brothers' careers combined? <laughs> <laughs> he put, the answer to that is yes, I think. <laughs> yeah, you know, I gotta say, yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, if you take out uh, uh, Kovalev and Ward, who are gonna be busy with each other, this guy might be the best light heavyweight out there. We just don't know, Donny. I'm reserving judgment on him at the moment, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, I think the from oh, Farber, you could put down two catching him cold, and then yeah. Hopkins, you know. Mm. I mean, he knocked out two top ten guys, including one legend, you know, uh, and and knock one of them out of the ring. I mean, it, he's had a good year. Yeah, yeah, can't argue with that. Right, let's move on to the undercard. Just very briefly before we do, we mentioned Jean Pascal. I did, wasn't aware of the fact he was actually boxing Pascal on Friday night. He knocked out Ricardo Marcelo Romalo in uh, Quebec, Canada. Did they know? The wagon rolls on. I did not know that fight was actually happening. No, neither did I. Rubber match with Kovalev, maybe, Andy? 
Uh, if he wants to start finishing that, touches, they could call the card finishing touches. Can't uh, did the business. If he, if he wants to start that racist shit again, then I send them send them to dogs and let them get executed. Eh? <laughs> Can you call it a rubber match when he got completely destroyed in both the previous? Well, not not really. No. <laughs> I mean, you got you got to get Pascal. Pascal's tough as fuck, man. But come on, that's 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 a, that's a that's a career ender. If, I mean, you want to see men earn a couple of paydays or whatever. I mean, he's probably earned it as such, considering. But you know, nah, fuck that. No, Dave's quite quite right with the terminology. A, a third fight, but no, whatever you call it, we don't we don't want to see it. Onto the undercard, uh, Joseph Diaz with a decent win over Horacio Garcia. A few other guys got wins. Jason Quigley with a good first round knockout over Jorge Melendez. I remember many years ago sitting in a boxing gym in Belfast with an old boy, Patsy McAllister. He must be nearly 90 now, Patsy. And I asked him who he thought the biggest prospect of Irish boxing was. This was about 2008, 2009. And he said there's a young kid over in Donegal, Finn, Finn Valley Boxing Club, I think it was, called Jason Quigley. He says, watch out, he's going to be a world champion in a few years' time. And I tell you what, he was world champion as an amateur and he's really flying through the, the pro ranks. I don't know if anybody saw the win and how you rate Quigley, but he's really starting to ground himself into a nice professional now, big puncher. I've I, I seen, I seen, I I, so I, I seen the, the link to the, the knockout. I think uh, Golden Boy put it on YouTube last night. He was, I think I tweeted it out. He was an absolute beast there last night. Um, other than that, Alexander Usyk got a knockout win over Thabiso Machuno for the WBO Cruiserweight title. Good defence for Usyk. He's a big old lump. He was he was tearing over Machuno, hard punching, but out of his depth, South African, really. Good performance by Usyk. I want to ask you something, Andy, before we go to the guys, actually, on this. A lot of people seem to be quite enthusiastic and encouraged about Usyk's progress, and they're basically looking ahead to whenever he moves up to heavyweight. But a lot of his stoppages, I think, come from accumulation and accuracy and wearing people down. So first of all, I would wonder whether he would be such a big puncher at heavyweight. And he doesn't seem to hydrate massively over the 200-pound limit. Do you think he's going to be this all-encompassing, all-defeating beast up at heavyweight? I think he might not be as effective as we think. What did they rehydrate to? The I HBO? saying he was just, uh, just over 200 pounds or something, not far over. Well, what is it? He must be pushing 30 now, so you would think if you know most of the filling out he's doing... You know, obviously he's he's a fully grown man now, but exactly. you know, you're just wondering how much he's he's maybe shedding. Then, he's, obviously, if a guy's just over two hundred pounds, he's obviously then walking about his fighting weight or whatever. But, um, yeah, I mean, he did what he had to do last night. I mean, Machuno was was obviously a tricky opponent. He was he was you know small as such, some small such, but he was finding his openings. You know, he was finding the the, the left hand, a couple of short right hooks inside as well. Actually, you know, maybe Usyk was just taking it kind of. And nonchalantly as, as such, because he just he really felt what Machuno kind of basically had to offer him, and he just decided to eat, eat it up. It was always always going to be the case actually if, if Machuno's gas tank held up. I think we mentioned it last week, um, but I think Usyk just started kind of jabbing the body and just basically kind of like you know, using the manoeuvres. I, I know Kurt wasn't too happy with the pity party stuff and all that, but once once Usyk kind of starts letting his hands go and that, he can be quite a club and puncher. Um, I just think he's he. he, he Thinks he's way running a bit of fight maybe too much or whatever, because I think early in that fight he was he was slow at the traps. I mean, you could say definitely that Machuno won the second round and maybe the first round was was, was a swing round. You could maybe you know for argument say get to Machuno if he wanted, but then you know the third round he really then kicked into gear and he, you know maybe took a round off here or there, but then he kind of really kicked it in in six and obviously again the ninth round not uh, stopped him twice. So I dropped him down twice actually and maybe forced a stoppage. But I know what you mean. Um, moving up, you know, obviously he's going to if he's going to move up, it's it's going to be purely bo- boxing skills. He's going to have to rely on his movement and stuff. Um, obviously he did take a few shots here last night. There's nothing that suggests that he's chinny. Um, but again, Machino's not a big puncher, so we never need to see him in with a, you know obviously a bigger puncher. But up at heavyweight. Um, it's going to be box move, uh, tie it up if if he can. But I I can't see him rehydrating as much. And uh, obviously, if he's clean, he's not going to he's not going to bulk up that much either anyway. So I wouldn't think unless he hits the weights big time. Yeah, for the record, yeah, I am a new sick fan. I like the look of that out there because it was a few observations I'd made. Donny, I know you didn't see a hell of a lot of this fight, so um, I'm not going to ask you about the nuances of Machunu getting in and getting the body shots off and all these type of things, but just generally in a wider career sense, Usyk strikes me as the type of guy who wants to unify, he wants to fight the best fighters. There's definitely the opponents out there. I actually caught up on the lebedev Gassier fight there yesterday uh, on YouTube, and I was impressed with both guys, two potential opponents for Usyk. 
Bellew is going around calling himself the best cruiserweight in the world. Realistically, he's about three or four, but he does have a WBC title at the moment after the Hay fight. I mean, uh, who knows what he's going to do? Basically, Usyk, who, who do we see him fighting next, or who would you like to see him fight next, Donna? Well, I'd like to see him fight the guy that was Bellew's manager, is Maris Bredis. Hmm. He should fight him, yep. That yeah, would be dude. damn good. I want to see that too. Yeah. Well, it's a, well, you're right, Donna. Maybe we've said it before. I mean, it's the it's the biggest, well, it's probably the best division for the hipsters, if you want to say it for a better word. Brothers, yep, good fight. I mean, there is good fights to be made there. Could Rashov coming back up the ranks as well? But I, that's a good shout, Brothers. Any more shit? What's happened, any to any other, shit? What's, what's, what's happened to the other guy? Remember the guy that won in France? Uh, is it Dotkwa? Sam to him, he, he knocked to a uh, Kalinga. 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 Yeah, yeah it was Sam to them too. He is ranked very highly by the WBA, but quite what that means, I don't know. Andy, is he in line for a regular, an interim, a, an eternal title? I mean, who knows? I think it might have been an uh, interim title or something. Maybe I don't know. I, I don't know there's a WBA title on the ring uh, on the line for that fight back in France. But is, uh, isn't Lebedev the WBA champion because he kept hold of his belt, didn't he? By some no, he got knocked out. He got knocked out of Gazev. Yeah, but did, did, was his, did he not keep his belt or something? Oh, I right, that was right, right. That's right. That's right. He took it off the line. That's right. You're right enough. I don't quite know how he got away with that. Sorry, Dave. Go I ahead. I think it was something to do with the fact that he wasn't ranked or something at WBA at the time. And uh, oh, right. obviously, it's just a safeguard. It's a business move, obviously. Yeah, but you know, obviously, then word came out two, three days afterwards that apparently he went to the hospital for precaution for a potential brain bleed. I meant to mention that last week. Mm, doesn't sound good, does it? Uh, Dave Lowback, you want to add anything on this? No, not really. I didn't see the fight. Um, I still have yet to see what's so good about Usyk. Granted, I only seen him fight once, uh, so I should probably really uh, delve into his career because I think he, from what I hear, he is going to be one of the next uh, big things. Um, the brightest fight, I would watch that immediately, and I think that would be a real test for both guys. He yeah, wasn't he knocked out. He was actually beat on points. That's what it was. I'm just looking through Lebedev's record now. I see they got knocked out, didn't they? Oh, oh that's okay, Andy. Don't worry. We're, we're not holding against you. Um, don't forget, guys, we have a few Twitter questions coming up later. Bell you of the week right at the end of the show. And our yearly awards, fight of the year, card of the year. I don't think it's going to be an awards as such. We're just going to throw out our uh, fight of the year, knockout of the year, knobhead of the year, all the different things that we can come up with. Uh, we have Amir Khan on the line. Um, I think he sobered up a bit after last week. Amir, do you want to say anything about Bernard Hopkins? Did you watch the fight last night? First off, I went. Um, I didn't. I didn't watch the fight, but I watched the knockout, and uh, I was off. I was off my chair. He fell out the ring, didn't he? Um, <laughs> he did I, mean, I don't he did. know. I don't. I don't know if he had a bet <laughs> on that on himself or on doing that, but that was something else. I've not seen that before. Um, I've seen fighters. Almost out of the ring, and then they, they get held up. But he looked gone, so it must have been a hard, hard punch. Yeah, it was. It was a combination. But there are plenty of fighters who've fallen out the ring. If you rewind back, whenever the podcast drops on iTunes, we went through a list of them. So there's plenty of times. I've just happened. remembered one, Steve. I just remembered another one: Kermit Sunshine yes. against Paul Williams. Yes, that, did they mention that one? Was, yeah, I did mention that one. I wasn't sure if it was Sintron or not. Kermit Sunshine, right? Ended up in the fucking. Remember, he ended up in the, the ambulance with a neck brace on. I, I, couldn't, yeah. I remember Paul Williams did do it to somebody. Paul old Kermit Sintron. Right, Tammy, if you don't want to talk about Hopkins, what do you want to talk to us about? Um, I want to mention um, Sasha, you know, uh, not the woman, the actual uh, boxer. Fuck him. Um, I, think, I think he needs um, a taste of his own medicine. I mean, he's beating these people up, almost killing them. I mean, we all know he's on, he's on, he's on the gear, don't we? It's not yeah. natural, is he? No. One. So I think, I, um, I think basically um, he needs testing and he needs banning. Well, he's a repeated offender, isn't he? So I think that whoever's going to do the banning better hurry up and do it. But I mean, what can you do if he's getting opponents in as replacements, oh. even if people want to fight him or not? And it's a shame, I'm here because I wanted to see the Wilder fight. I just can't see him. Um... Fighting out of Russia, to be honest, I think he's um, he's just going to stay there and just make a living out of uh, you know taking drugs and beating people <laughs> and putting them in comas, you know. <laughs> I mean, it, it, if you really think about it too, the the arrogant attitude <clears throat> that him 
and his manager had after that whole Wilder fiasco, and they said, no, 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 you know, we didn't really take it. It was just, it was in his system or whatever, and, and this was just a whole big, um, you know, ploy by the Wilder camp to get out of the fight. Our guy is clean. This is outrageous. The WBC is corrupt because uh, they want to see Wilder keep the title, blah, blah, blah. And they went through this whole, you know, um, you know, laundry list of, of complaints of bias and, uh, and, and that he was targeted uh, for political reasons. And what happens in his next fight, he fucking tests 30 again, and this time for something else, you know. So, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, to me, they're a bunch of jokers, and uh, he needs to be banned, not just for being a repeat offender, but also for, you know, uh, that high and mighty attitude he, he, he took after the first time when, you know, he tested dirty and he was trying to, you know, claim it was everybody else's fault but himself. And now he get, he pops dirty again or whatever. And he, he made everyone else think that that he was right, you know, or at least some people. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, the, the fact is, is that the guy likes to dope and he needs to be banned for one to two years, in my opinion, so that the fucking message is, is uh, effectively communicated. As as clearly, I mean, if you go back to the Huck fight, he was a fat mess, and he went life and death with Huck, who came up, obviously came up for cruiserweight. Look at his body physique; he's basically he's took the fat off, and he's kind of like you know, basically kind of bulked up slightly. But uh, I'm going to slightly disagree about the the stuff about the first time, because well, obviously I think he'd been tested before a few times, and he passed, and then he fucking failed a test, but it was for trace amounts or whatever it was. Um, and at that time as well, there was there was a situation where as there was a lot of appeals going on against us at Meldonium. Uh, the drug had got banned, or there'd been notification come out three months before that drug was getting banned in January. So you just, I think there'd been no tests had been done to see how long that just stayed in your system for. So you can see, you can understand why people maybe make make a make a, a argument from that way. But this this is this is this is fucked. I mean, obviously, I think if you go back to listen to a previous podcast about Booty against the Gale. Um, if you go back and look at that fight, Booty, who was obviously done for the same stuff that Pavek has been been done on, you know, he looked he looked really good. You know, if it, I wouldn't say obviously he wasn't a prime, but you know, he hung with the Gale, he was pressing the fight, he was he, he was he was basically energetic going down the stretch of the fight. Now we fucking know why. Look at Pavek and yesterday. Now I didn't watch the fight because after the the fight got uh, sorry the previous the, the initial fight got pulled, I said I'm not fucking watching it. But if you look at the way he knocked him out, just, you know, just the sheer brutality, I'm just kind of coming forward there. Oh, it was just, I said to myself, if this test comes back dirty for the B sample, it's going to get turned into a, a, a no decision anyway, or a, a no contest. Fucking Doufus, man, what, happened, what would have happened to him if, if he, he was seriously stretched, stretched out there last night? What happened if something happened to him? With that hanging over the top of it. And there's uh, Shabrinsky, who I believe is the vice president of the Russian Boxing, or the Russian Professional Boxing Association, or whatever it is. I knew he's, he's complaining or he's stating that he's not convinced by Vada Tessin and he's trying to explain his doubts about it. In my opinion, Vada Tessin, in my personal opinion, this, you know, obviously you've got your own opinion on it, you can maybe come back to me with something else, but I think their integrity is beyond reproach. They, if they find a dirty test, they report it, and I think they are the best people. If you're not enrolled with Vada, in my opinion, you're suspicious. I was talking to a, a sports, I will to tell you actually what he does, but um, he just basically he worked along some athletes and stuff, and he actually picked out this young lassie who he believed to be on steroids or some sort of PED, the acne and all that sort of stuff. Blitzed the Olympics, uh, never be seen it again until she came back for the next Olympics. Done the same thing. Um, you know, there's there's recently there's been articles coming out. I guess it's like Gregory Rodjenkov or something. He's been handing out vitamins, Vildas. So he's been handing out sorry drugs, Vildas vitamins. So did the actual athletes know what they get? What they're getting doped with and stuff? Does Pivetkin know what he's getting take? Uh, what he's taking? Who knows, man? Russia's. It's not want to turn into a big debate about Russia and all that sort of stuff. But obviously, everything points to them just now. Um, it's disappointing. I was raging that Pivetkin got pulled out of that fight against Wilder, he fucked it up himself, he's fucked up his career again, and uh, as the guys rightly say, he needs a lengthy ban, um, you know, if he had been a British British boxer, my personal opinion, he would have, basically, the minimum he'd have got would have been two years. Yeah. I think he needs uh -huh. worse than a ban, I think he needs some, some kind of punishment for all the, the unlawful damage he's inflicted upon uh, these opponents. <laughs> Yesterday <it> was <laughs> No, I just chop his fucking head off. That's what they do in Russia, right? <laughs> or <laughs> I would love to see. I would love to see him fight clean, because it because if he is clean, he's going to be a fat mess. Going to be a pregnant piece of shit like he was against Vlad. Oh, and this 
this this really uh, regained some of my respect for Vladimir, even after that that pussy head buddy threw at Tyson Fury. This I love Vlad now for beating the crap out of Povetkin. Um, I can watch that. I mean, there was a horrible fight, but I feel like watching it right now just to see that fat sack of shit get roughed up. And I hope it happens again. That's all I ever want to see him do again. I want to see him in with Joshua. I think Joshua would just demolish him. <laughs> yeah, just, two Dave, roids on roids. Just, just, going back to that, <laughs> uh, just going back to that Klitschko fight against Pavetkin, actually, was there no some sort of dis- was Klitschko no want the German authorities to, to handle drug testing for that fight? I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't trust. He, did, the, he didn't trust the Russians, did he? And, and in retrospect, it looks like Blame. a pretty smart. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Did he get? He must have got his way, though, eh? With the Germans. Yeah, I think the so. Person. He must have got his way. Eh? So on Saturday, Andy, just to tidy things up, because as I said, I was at work and I wasn't following all this. Am I right in saying that Povetkin failed some kind of test? Yeah. Stevern got fed up, hooked it, and they got to the Hapas in. What happened, mate? I woke up about eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning. Just got up, just lays in the book, got the phone out. I'm saying to myself, what the fuck's happening here? Fight off, fight off, oh, fuck, what's going on here? And we found out that he's been done for Osterine. Is it, is it, I think it's Osterine anyway. It's the same thing that Butu got, uh, got, got done for. I forget the medical name for it. But uh, basically, at that, at that moment, at 9 o'clock in the morning, the fight was on at that point. The WBC were they then refu- uh, withdrew uh, their title for the fight. Stavern then decided he was leaving and... I believe Doufus was already in the country anyway, and he decided, decided to step in. I don't know how much he got paid for it. it. Must have been shitloads of money to take that. Was he training? Probably no. Um, They've already had the, the happers on the line, haven't they? Like days b- uh, before, they know some shit could potentially go down. Well, yeah, mate, to be see to be honest, if if they're doping, if they if they the team themselves know that he's doping, Sabrinsky knows he's doping. Yeah, that's his promoter, obviously. Yeah. But I, again, I mean, I think I, I also say I think it was Luce, uh, basically called Pugmire for the LA Times. He was stating that apparently that the B sample was getting flown to America for testing, and it would take five to six days to arrive there. Mm. And he did state at that time that you know the, he, he expected Shabrinsky to basically step up and say that you know he was uh, you know, he had his concerns about it. And lo and behold, he's, he's an article here in Boxing Scene just now and stuff just. Uh, See if I can get some quotes for it and that. But it says here, the key question is why are we getting positive test results? They all repeatedly prove negative in, in all other laboratories, including the US lab, except for one random sample that we get uh, get immediately prior to the fight. Don't want to jump to conclusions, just want to say it's a strange coincidence. Well, Sky obviously refused to show the fight, Andy. I think as much of the fact that the new Dahab is going to be a shit spectacle as anything else. And can we expect them to now stop showing Ortiz, Galahad, etc. fights in future? Uh, yep, that as well. Jake, well, you know, I had no problem bringing, bringing Shaw and you know previously failed drugs tested uh, James Tony over before. There's no, there's no morals at end of the day in boxing. Come on, so about the there's time a co- common denominator. If you think about it, all these fighters that have taken drugs have all done shit. So. They're, they're taking drugs because they think they can do better and get a, a com- unfair competitive advantage. But when it comes down to it, you don't really do them any favours. Well, I just worry that someone's going to end up getting killed and then where does it leave you then? But, I mean, we've been through all this been through all this many times. I think we'll move on from the Russian card. Just going to say, finally, uh, Vasily Lepikin returned. We last saw him losing to Isaac Chilemba. They talk about taking baby steps. He fought, this is, this is quite a disgusting fight, actually. He fought Mark Chimidov, who was 3-2-2. Two, and two. I mean, why is he fighting a, a fighter who only had seven fights? And there was the WBC, Eurasia Pacific Boxing Council, light heavyweight title fight on the line. So why, why are the WBC sanctioning people who've only had seven fights and two of them were losses, two were draws? To fight against an eighteen and one guy, I mean, it's just it's just despicable. Disgusting, mate. It's just disgusting. Insecure Russian bastards. Well, I meant to say actually, I don't know if anybody anybody's uh, remember. Remember Clarence Tillman? Yes. He used to come on. Yeah, we, the, the heavyweight guy. The I he was meant to fight yesterday in New Zealand, but he, he got called off because he's. Well, this is just letting the boys know, obviously, just to say that his missus took no well yesterday. So she's all right. Like, I've got in touch with him. Oh, oh that's man. good. Clarence is a good guy. Hopefully everything's okay with the Tillman family. We'll have to try and get Clarence back on at some point. He gives good insight. Aye. Get him on for the uh, Joshua Klitschko fight. Aye. 
we'll, we'll try we'll try and do that right uh, amir hold fire i'm going to ask you a question in a minute about brooke and and amir khan your namesake i know that you wanted to come on and talk about that before you do let's just clear up another couple of shows i'm sure the guys are desperate to talk about these Vijendra Singh knocked out Francis Checker out in India. Didn't see it, couldn't tell you a thing about it. And out in Finland, Edis Tatley uh, defend, successfully defended his uh, European lightweight title against Manuel Lancia. Wins for Robert Hellenius and Eva Wallström on the undercard. Anybody want to talk about any of that stuff? I Hellenius looked absolutely fucking awful against that spectacular tattooed fuckwit. Uh, <laughs> Or, or, there's, I forget what page it is on YouTube, but there is a copy of the fight on it. Just go and watch this guy's tattoos, man. He's, he's bald headed, like, so he's covered fucking head to, I would imagine, right down his fucking legs and that, covered in tattoos. What a mess he is. Um, Kurt mentioned something last night, actually. You know, obviously, Hassan Nandam beat that Alfonso Blanco uh, in one of the French colonies or whatever. But remember, Gambo was meant to fight on that card last night mm. against Malcolm Class. Mm. Aye. Kurt apparently said that uh, Class and apparently failed a drugs test before the fight. And mm. I went on the check box right this morning to see the result, see if the fight still went ahead or whatever, and uh, it's not there. So it's obviously been pulled at the last second, eh? Yeah, it hasn't gone ahead. The only fights that went ahead were four fights of limited uh, interest, including a Willie Bland fight. Uh, obscure fans of boxing, I remember Willie Bland. He was a good amateur back in the day. But anyway, Michel Soro defeated Nuhu Lawal for a WBA shitty title, and Alfonso Blanco got knocked out. <laughs> Is he all right? Has anybody checked on him? He's, he's fine, mate. He's fine, but I think, uh, see, to be honest, I know it's a war ceremony and that, but that uh, that is that is going to be right up there. That was, oh, especially because it was, cause it was there, beautiful. It was, I know it was beautiful, but also savage at the same time and deadly. Because obviously the guy just went doing face first, didn't they move for like five <laughs> seconds, and they decided to try and walk. Was... Who knew it was Hassan and Dam had that kind of power? Or Blanco chop? had that type of chin. Oh, I think it's combination. Blanco was meant to be getting highly tipped or whatever, not, but uh, fucking Nandam, man, I thought it was a tempo shot until I seen the slow motion replay. It was, you know, a chopping shot right down on uh, the side of the chin. Eh? Fucking short wire, Jesus Christ. Yeah, Blanco Dave was from Venezuela, based in Oxnard, California. Supposed to be a decent enough prospect. I don't think anyone had too high hopes of him, but they thought he was going to be give Nandam a good test before he got almost literally shot in the face, Dave. I don't I don't know anything about um, Blanco. I don't know anything about Blanco except for the fact that he was originally from Venezuela and was undefeated at the time. Um, but I saw I only saw the gif of the fight. I'm pulling it up right now to watch the whole thing such as it is. Um, but I mean it was beautiful. Beautiful knockout and good for and damn. I hope he can come again at middleweight because I, th I still think that um, him versus Golovkin. I mean, I know he's going to lose that fight. I, I assume he's going to lose that fight, but it's more interesting than the crap Golovkin's fought. I've actually got it up there now, right? I'm just looking at it now. Bang, right hand. He's just basically he's dead at that point. Face first, he, fucking forehead right in the canvas, and literally he's only he's so he's basically semi on his knees, forehead in the canvas, and you just see his legs trying to kind of walk. It's like he's trying to walk, you know, it's, oh, it's beautiful. Donny, there was a dodgy WBA title on the line, some kind of interim bullshit. Blanco was ranked very highly by the WBA. I think he was one or two. And Dam now could conceivably jump in for a shot at whatever Jacobs drops or Golovkin drops. I'm getting confused. Well, no, Jacobs yeah. isn't dropping anything. He's fighting Golovkin. I after okay, well, after they the winner... It just, it just got announced for March 18th and... Uh... Madison Square Garden the night after the college Friday. Donna, you're breaking up. You're breaking up a wee bit. Is anybody oh, how about now? How about now? Ah, you're fine now. <laughs> Just mute it. Yeah. Sorry, Donny. Unmute Donnie, yourself, yourself Donny. Oh, I said uh, Jacobs <laughs> and Golovkin will be fighting uh, on March 18th at the Garden the night after the uh, Conlon uh, debut. I says, and uh, Mr. Thomas Allen and I will be in attendance at both Ah, you lucky bastard, eh? You, yeah, fucking, yeah. Just, just the way that's came off. So, Tom, I, I Colin fights on the Friday night, and then uh, Golovkin fights Jacobs on the Saturday. Is that is that a Madison Square Garden or a Bartley's? Uh, yeah, the Garden. The Garden. Oh, yeah. my good stuff. Lucky bastards. Yeah, I know, huh? Brilliant. Well done, Tommy. Wait a minute, well though. Wait, wait a minute. Are you actually going to even survive a two-day bender with Tommy? <laughs> I don't know. It's... Uh... 
the uh, the, the odds makers don't give me a good chance. But uh... I'm telling you, man, he'll 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 be buzzing all that snow like Jesus we, Christ. We we, we got to get Smito on here to get uh, to get us some odds on that one. <laughs> nah, man, Donny is that Donny, like Jimmy Savile? But by the time you're finished, man, you be fucking you be fucking need a new spleen. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> anyway, moving on, moving on. Um, we're going to come to the Fantasy Springs Casino very shortly. Uh, did you, did you finish saying what you were saying, Donny? Sorry. Oh no, no, just just that. Um, basically, once uh, they fight, I guess you know, then um, uh, what's his name, Hassan Endam will probably uh, they'll probably elevate him to uh, regular champion or something. You know, because apparently they're not reducing belts now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was getting at, but you put it more succinctly than me. I think he will pick up a belt of some meaningless description. Yeah. Right, I'm here. Talk to me. Talk to me. I'm not going to ask you about Shabransky Barrera. We'll wait till you've gone. Talk to me about this Amir Khan Kel Brook fight. 90% happening. Amir seems to think it's a, some kind of tune up or um, something. I've seen um, Eddie uh, give a few interviews. I'm reading between the lines, and um, he keeps saying uh, the talking and. Uh, Khan's got um, Asif Bali back there now, and I'm pretty certain the fight's going to happen because I don't know if you guys know, Khan's made the um, papers again for various things. Uh, yes, tr- know. You know, rumours or actual things that have gone on, we don't know. We don't Bell with the weak material. We're not taken with a pinch of salt. But anyway, I reckon I reckon them two will get it on. I'm thinking uh, next summer, around May or June time. Maybe July, I'm not sure, but... I'm fairly certain now they've got no other choice and they'll make a load of money and, you know, it's, it'll be an actual pay-per-view if them two fight. Um, what about the I, venue? Where's it going to take place? I think Eddie keeps saying up north somewhere. Manchester. So the only places I can... The only things I can think of are the uh, MEN, um, the Etihad, obviously, or Old Trafford. So any one of them three would be, would be brilliant and I'd probably go to it if I would get... If oh, he died. Something Amir's- good. Yeah, I, I, I liked Amir last week when he was full of the Ching or MCAT, whatever as he was on. <laughs> the special brew. Skitt- Skittles and iron brew. Fucking hell. Shah Khan broke into his house and executed him in case oh. he was going to say it. Oh. Is. Oh. Yeah. 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 Amir, we love so, As yeah, I was saying, I, I, don't, I don't know what you guys have heard, but I think that, I think he's working on that fight next year because there's a lot of pressure on him now. IT, ITV have even got pay-per-view with the shitty U-Banks and IBO and God knows what belt what belt is he, he's going to fight for next. Uh, so I think there's a lot of pressure on him now and uh, Warren is also doing something BT Sport. So I'm fairly certain that fight will happen because, I mean, us, us hardcore boxing fans have been absolutely fucked over. We're not stupid um, and they do listen to us and I think that fight will happen. And what will happen when it does? Who's going to win and how? Um, it's anyone's guess, isn't it? I, I don't know. I think if uh, Kelbrook uh, takes him out early, he takes him out. If the longer the fight goes on, I think Khan's got a chance. Just need Khan, to win. Khan's getting flatlined, baby. We'd have this oh, oh, that... to predict cold. But Virgil's done uh, some magic with Andre Ward. I'm not saying Khan's an Andre Ward's level, but, you know, uh, trained by the same guy. And, you know, Khan's a total different fighter to Ward. The winter, to- totally different. I, but, I had to uh, and Andy's on a five-minute ban for saying that Amir Khan's getting flatlined. I, I like that one bit. <laughs> I don't think he's going to get knocked out. I, I think he might go down a few times. I can't, see him being, I can't see him being a Pacquiao Marquez or Pacquiao, rather, the way Pacquiao went down that night. I can see, I can see uh, an even fight. I, I can't pick a winner at the moment. I probably will pick someone on the day. Not you guys are picking, but... I'm picking Khan. Well, Not because you're on Amir. Obviously, we need to wait to see what the what the weight's going to be, obviously going to be. I mean, is it going to be at 147? I don't know. I mean, can Brooks still make that weight? Who knows? Can you hear it, Donny? You're breaking up again. Donny, you've got all Stephen Hawking on us again. Hello? Aye. <laughs> I was saying, if, uh, if Khan is smart, he has to make it a 147, because that'll curb a little bit of... Brooks punching power, I think, because it'll make it'll make it harder for him to to get so out what, of that weight. If I, was, if I was Khan, I'd be like, I'm doing this fight, but I'm only doing it at one four seven. I think that's the smart play for from his perspective. This is what's frustrating about these guys. Neither one of them are active. They don't do shit. So, like, how do we even know if Brook can make one forty seven? I don't think exactly. he can. Exactly. I mean, that's another thing as well. 
So the they, guys got to win in forever. Like, what, what are we doing? It's, I mean, the other thing is, well, why the fuck does, does, does Brook need to come down to 147 for? I mean, he's made his money. He got whatever it was, three, four million for that, that Golovkin fight. I think I'm right in saying that. So why the fuck does he need to drain himself to come down to 147 for? He could just fuck off and retire. Enjoy himself, you know? You know, you know he likes to enjoy himself, you know? If he wants to continue fighting, it'll probably be at 154. He's, he's looking fat. Ah, he was. I forget what fight he was at recently. Actually, he looked fuck. He looked worse than Jaran actually. And in, in in, well, back in his day. And Khan, what the hell's he been doing since Canelo? He's done nothing. He needs to win here. He needs to fight. He needs to be active. He's been. He's, put, he's been spent, spending all that money. He's been putting flyers out in his family. The new aren't he? Yeah. <laughs> sleep my sleep my missus Michael Jackson. <laughs> Nah, I'm joking. She's obviously she's a bit nice, lass. So who knows? But that is that is some fucking situation. Like, and to be honest, it's hitting the fucking news, fucking front page in the newspapers. That's that's there's, there's bigger things in the world to, to worry about than some fucking wee gimp's fucking wife. By the way. <laughs> yes, there's bigger things to worry about, says Andy. Right, we'll move on from this. I think to our final show of the weekend uh, on Friday evening, Fantasy Springs Casino, Vyacheslav Bransky. Knocked out in the, I want to say the seventh round. It could have been the eighth round. I can't exactly remember at this point. By Sullivan Barrera. On the undercard, we saw Ronnie Rios defeating Roy Tapia and Eddie Gomez get knocked out by Rashid Ellis. Andy, um, this is one of those fights where I wasn't really quite sure beforehand what would happen, but something just became glaringly obvious during the fight. This happens quite often. And the thing was, Shabansky just couldn't get out the way of the right hand. Exactly, mate. I had no fucking head movement. Uh, it was seven round, mate, the knockout. Uh, aye, it was... You're kind of saying yourself, kind of early doors. I don't think Barrera really had to kind of mix it up as such. You know, he didn't need to kind of change his style as such because he just found a home for that right hand, you know, basically for the off. I think he got a knockdown. Yeah, he got a knockdown in the first round. Fifth, I think, uh, was again in the sixth or the seventh, I think. And obviously the knockout. Um, yeah, I just, he just couldn't get, uh, get out of the way of the, the shot, so... You know, that was another guy. I think Shabransky kind of coming into the fight. I think he got he got a gift recently. Who was that against? Was it Gonzalez? That was the guy. Pascal, the guy was Pascal fought. Was, was it a gift though, Andy? I, I thought it was a close fight. Now, I just think it was a close fight to switch. But then, if you look at the scorecards in that fight, mate, I think one of them basically almost had that shot out, if I remember rightly. But you know, I think that was one of the major complaints about that. But no, as I say, I think uh, back the drum for that for that guy. I'm glad for Barrera actually, because obviously, if you look at the when he fought Andre Ward, he did manage to tag Ward a few times with the right hand. Um, so you kind of you kind of thought yourself going into that Kovalev fight with Ward. You kind of think, well, if Barrera's tagging him. Kovalev's going to catch him mm. at some point, didn't we? We, we? we all said that. We all thought that. So, uh, fair, fair play to Barrera. Uh, obviously, gets himself right back into the mix for a title shot. But again, light heavyweight. Ward, the way he's talking just now, actually, he's talking about you know a, a rematch with Kovalev. You know, needs to make sense. I think you know the way he's sounding. Maybe it's business talk. I don't know. Maybe he has wanted to retire. What does he need to fight for anymore? He's got his money. Um, so you can probably see him getting held up there. You know, I think there's going to be a queue of fighters in the next. Eight months went for title shots actually, and it's going to all hinge on Andre Ward. So they'd be surprised to see some sort of kind of WBC silver title getting added into the mix here somewhere. Let's hope so. I don't know if any of our uh, Yankee friends managed to get to see this. If I remember, Barrera came out, got the jab working. He landed about four right hands in a row on Shabransky, dropped him in the first round. Then, inexplicably, Shabransky dropped Barrera in the second round. I think he caught him with a little left hook and then a right hand to the back of the head. But then it was all Barrera. From that point, he dropped him again in the sixth round. And it was just right hand after right hand. Shabransky was too brave for his own good. And I thought his corner was going to be too brave for his own good. But to be fair to them, they stepped up in the seventh round. They said, look, he's taking too many shots. Called over one of my favourite referees, Eddie Claudio. And they called the, the fight off. Johnny, Dave, did any of you see, two guys see this? Looks, It sounds like it's pretty good. Four knockdowns. It's like uh, the, uh, what was it, Sellers-Thompson fight. Yeah, um, I'd like to watch it. I haven't seen it, though. It uh, looking at the result though, it uh, enhances Andre Ward's year and uh, gives more props to his chin. Donny, light heavyweight doesn't look too bad. I know we've got a Donny Stevenson doing his best road runner impression, but there's quite a few guys just below the elite as well who could fight each other. Arta Baturbia fights the day before Christmas Eve, for example. He's uh, at least he's active. I mean, level of opposition isn't the greatest. Is he against Isidro Prieto, twenty six one and three, one of these Argentinians. No idea about him, Donny, but you've got Shabransky, you've got Gonzalez, you've got Joe Smith as well, Gavosdik. Actually, I saw I caught up with Gavosdik Chilemba. 
I quite like the look of him. I'm just throwing names at you, Donny, really. Sorry about that. Did you see Barrera Shabransky? Uh, no, I didn't see it, but, uh, but you're right. The uh, It's weird because at, at Light Heavyweight, you kind of have this, you know, the Kovalev Ward level, and then everybody else, except the, the everybody else, are actually pretty good. Uh, and you just named a bunch of them. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah, the division is very much heating up. Uh, it's just that you have two guys at the top of that division that are just head and shoulders above everybody else, but that doesn't mean that... Uh, that some great fights can't be made among those uh, guys in the top 10. Okay, I think that's everything from the weekend. Correct me if I'm wrong. Have I missed any shows or anything that was happening and I haven't mentioned it? Um, no. I'm trying to think, mate. I don't think there is, is there? Oh, yeah. I'll tell you one thing there is. Uh, Costa's you, son Tim you made his uh, professional debut in Australia. At oh, age aye. Seventeen. I, I, I was on one of the torrent sites actually. There was, there was a wee ten-minute documentary on the on the fella and stuff. I haven't watched it yet, but uh, I just noticed that Luis Luis Neri uh, from Mexico, man on weight. I think he's almost the cusp of title shot now. Uh, I think he won by knockout last night in the fourth round, and uh, Canelo's brother as well. He came back with a victory against some American fighter. For phone knockout. Don, so, so, uh, robot again, Don. What are you doing? How, how about now? Ah, you're fine now. Yes, that's fine. I was going to say also, uh, Kostya's dog died, uh, Shih Tzu, so. <laughs> 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 Fucking tragic comedy, man. <laughs> Get out of here. Talking of farcical, I think we answered this question on Twitter earlier, Andy. Owen Hickey was saying, what was the worst moment for boxing this year that made the sport look the most farcical? This is a sport that shoots itself in the ass every week, isn't it? Oh, I'm sure, mate. I obviously, I mean, the one thing always springs to mind with me is either the, the situation with Saunders, Eubank and fucking Canelo all calling out Golovkin and every fucking one of them shot the bed, big style. Especially Eubank. You, you, you go all that distance, by the way, all that way to get a fight made and you literally got the paper right in front of you and you can't even sign it because your old man's a fucking gimp. Saunders, what about him? He, cut, he, he cuts a boot in his car with his belt on and stuff like that. Proud of yourself, but he can't even fucking make weight. He's fucking dying to make weight, actually. He looks like shit against some sort of like you know, brown envelope rank fucking Russian fighter. And who but the other one? Canelo. I'll fucking fight him anywhere. Aye, right, neighbor he's a prick. Oh, it's gonna be at one fifty five though. And here's another thing actually, what's that we fucking ginger toss are gonna to do actually when he fights uh, Chavez? Eh? What fight what what's what, what that gonna be? One fucking fifty five? No, one six one sixty five. One sixty five. So he yeah. can he can fight him at one sixty five, but he's going to drag the rest of him down at one fifty five. Yep, Absolute exactly. fucking wank. Wanker. His body's not ready for one sixty. Can some? I actually hope, I, I hate Chavez. I hope Chavez actually fucking beats him up, knocks him out, damages him and stuff, just so he doesn't get that Golovkin fight because Golovkin will fucking ruin him, ruin him. I want to see that. <laughs> see what? Chavez against Canelo? No, Chavez against Golovkin. I don't want to see Chavez in any meaningful fights. I don't know why he keeps on getting meaningful fights. He's like, oh, I'll take two years off. I'll smoke a bit of weed. I'll eat a bit of cereal. Oh, I think I might come back again. 68, 167. Oh, I might, you know, and then I might disappear again. Why, well, why is he getting these opportunities? I don't want to see him. Exactly, mate. And the other thing as well, j just go and watch that spa. I think it's uh, about 20 minutes on YouTube by him and Golovkin. I mean, Golovkin's toying one man. He's standing in the pocket, just slipping shots, fucking hitting him with kind of baby shots, then fucking hitting him to the body and that. It would be an, uh, he would fucking kill him and all. Sorry, he would massacre him, sorry. No, sorry, he would beat him up. I have had some tragedies. I just can't say too much, you know. Yeah. We're going to cover the stuff of the year very shortly, all of our talking points. Um, at this time, I'd just like to remind everybody we have Donny Baseball on the line, hey to Dave Lowback and Andy Patterson. I was expecting a stronger turnout this week, actually, as a few guys haven't turned up. Amir Khan was on the line, but he's disappeared now. Thanks to Amir for coming on. If you haven't been on the Facebook page and liked it, then what are you doing? Get the hell over there and do it right now. Subscribe on YouTube and leave a five-star review on iTunes. Nothing less than five stars is acceptable, guys. I have a few points um, on my notepad written out here, which I'm going to go through. I'm going to hit each one of you with one of them. Just uh, news and notes, I suppose you can call them, for want of a better expression. Donny, Terence Crawford, he's spending a month in jail. What's this all about? Uh, I don't think he actually will. Um, I mean, he fucking won't. No, he's, well, he's all right. I mean, they put him in jail. He only was there for a few hours, and they got him out on appeal. Um I mean, uh, I don't, I don't think he will, and for the simple reason that 
He's a first time offender. He's never had he has no record. You think so? And pardon? He doesn't get sentenced to jail time, Donny, if he's fucking if he's not a first if he's a first time offender. Surely in America that can't happen. Well well part of the problem was is that they know how much money he's worth and he had just made an, he went and made a fight or uh, had won a fight uh, you know, over the weekend before uh uh before the uh sentencing and you know, he was found guilty by you know, by a jury or whatever. So he had to he had to pay that that for that uh, body shop guy's uh, six thousand dollars for that lift, and he never paid it. And you know that's sort of like thumbing your nose to the law because uh, I mean it's one thing if the person you know comes into a court and says, well, you know I don't have the money, but I'll pay it over installments or something like that situation. But the guy obviously had six thousand dollars, and he had a few months to pay it, and he never did. And I think that that pissed off the judge. So I think that's why he got the sentence he got. So, um, you know, I mean, if they fight it out, maybe they can get it reduced to, you know, half of that. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, it was, uh, it was surprising to me, though, to see a guy with no criminal record get uh, 50 days for a nonviolent crime, really. I mean, he didn't, he didn't punch the guy or anything. Uh, it was a nonviolent crime. So I think, you know, I think he just angered the judge. And, yeah, uh, he's I been think given he... instructions, Don, and he's basically stuck his fingers up at them effectively. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Okay, uh, Dave Loback, uh, we didn't touch on this last week. I think it happened just before the pod, but Alejandro Gonzalez Jr. was shot dead. Some kind of nefarious goings on out in Mexico. Former Carl Frampton opponent was never going to be a world beater, but flip me, the kid was only 23. I don't know. I'm not familiar with the guy, but that was last weekend. Why do well, we need to build the wall? I'm building a wall, okay? Uh, we have to go back. <laughs> The guy got shot, Dave. I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, yeah, anybody else want to say anything about this? I mean, he was the guy who fought Frampton in July and dropped him twice. Aye, sad, mate. Uh, I don't know what, what it was about. Um, as you say, 23-year-old, you know, no age at all. Um, I don't know what fucking Dave's bringing the Donald <laughs> Trump into his fucking convo for, you know. Yeah, we're going to build that wall. Yes, we're going to build that wall. We're going to get Dave well, back <laughs> I assume he was shot by uh, some Mexican drug uh, drug dealers or some just Mexican thugs. I don't know. Maybe Quite possibly. Maybe, yeah. Unless maybe a, maybe an American went down there to Mexico just to shoot this this poor bastard who who dropped Carl Frampton. I, uh, I think what Dave's trying to say, that listeners. I think what Dave's trying to say is R.I.P. Alejandro Gonzalez. Thanks for the memories. Isn't that right, Dave? That's right. R- rest in peace. Uh, thank you for dropping Carl the Jack off. Um, I'm sorry you're dead. Um, honestly, true. I caught up this week, finally, Andy, with uh, Charlo against Williams. I think in the context of things, people were a bit upset about Charlo and the fact that he didn't, um, he was riling the crowd up and he wasn't, uh, you know, making friends with Williams at the end of the fight. But, I mean, this is a sport where we venerate the likes of Edwin Valero and Mike Tyson for mm-hmm. heinous crimes. This wasn't the worst crime in the world, was it? Although one thing no. I'll say, Andy, is he needs to get Charlo needs to get rid of those dickheads in the corner because they were pumping him up and weren't helping the situation. Ah, uh, his, his brother was there, mate, as well. But uh, I, I know what you mean. I, I said it last week actually. See if, he, if you're going to do that after the fight, as well, but do it, man. Just be, just, you know, if you're that pissed off, let people know about it. Then to try and then go back on it and apologise and all that sort of stuff, you know, it didn't really like, gain any credibility because, to be honest, I, I read some of the shit that he was getting and stuff, and I can understand why he was pissed off. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, that's what we kind of need that. I mean, guys like Broner we don't need because obviously he's he's fucking all, all mouth and the fucking substance. Charlo looks like he could be the business, you know, if he wants to be like that, be like that. As long as you back up in the ring, I have no problem with it. Donny. Uh, Chris Eubank is fighting Renald Quinlan, an Australian, for the IBO title on ITV pay-per-view. Are you gutted that you're not in the UK so you could buy the pay-per-view to this uh, world title attraction? I, I believe I said on I believe I said on Twitter that uh, you know that buying that pay-per-view should be right on your list, uh, right below uh, masturbating with sandpaper. Uh, is, that, you know. is, is that Quato against Cutland? You're talking about there? Yeah, yeah. It's, oh, it's, it's, it's even it's even worse Something than quit. that. Yeah, I won't be yeah, surprised oh if Quato loses that. I hope I hope Cotto gets injured or something like, that, like literally the, the day of the fight, or he falls in the stairs like when he's walking to the ring or something like that, and he tears his arterial cruciate ligament and he just he can't walk to the ring. He would just quit right there, <laughs> you know. Made, and everybody's bought all these fucking pay per view numbers and that, it's all fucked up. <laughs> and you know, give anybody a discount or a payback because he's just a, a greedy fucking Puerto Rican prick. <laughs> 
But what Fuck about God. Eubank Jr.'s pay per view? Oh. Anybody want to watch Eubank Jr.'s pay per view? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, the only reason to discuss this piece of shit is to insult him at the moment. I mean, what, what did he do? That he he was he was trashing Billy Joe Saunders for fighting at the some venue. I don't know. I'm not from the UK. I don't know these specific venues. But he was trashing him, and then he's fighting in the exact same one. I agree with that, Dave. The only reason we should be uh, talking about this guy is, is fucking insulting him. It's an absolute fucking disgrace. I mean, <laughs> as I say, people are saying, who is this guy? I briefly, as I say, as I touched upon a couple of podcasts ago, this guy fought Daniel Gill. Obviously, Gill's past his prime. He's up in weight and stuff, and he got bludgeoned off this guy. Basically, he got pummeled for one ring, one side of the ring to the other. Um, I didn't know much about him, in all honesty. But as I say, Eubank's going up in weight as well, so... What's this? Is that a kind of warm up fight or whatever? Is he getting ready to make the move up and wait? Because I, I wouldn't say he's a big puncher up at, uh, at one sixty, one sixty eight. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what he's draining himself, like, but uh, I kind of see him by the mean a bigger puncher up at one sixty eight because you know up there, guys are fucking different monsters up there a wee bit actually. So him and the Gale, fucking hell, man, the Gale would absolutely anal probe him. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of fights up at super middleweight, actually, we had a question from Lestin Venables. He says, with Paul Smith Jr. having three mismatches, then a world title fight, what would be the best way to combat this? And Scott Innes replied, shoot him. There is no way of combating this, guys, is there? Paul Smith's going to get title shots as long as Eddie can pay the sanctioning bodies legally or whatever to, to, put, to put the fights up. I was, I was kind of like, out of the loop over the last couple of days, like middle of the week and stuff like that. Who's he fighting? Is it, is it Zoiga? Zoiga, yeah. Tyron's all fucking hell. Yeah, mm. uh, so he got, so he, he's okay. Um, probably on this B B minus level or whatever. Um, fucking what's that? Super motherweight. Will he actually fucking make way of the fat bastard? That's the main thing. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Well, I don't even know where he's even ranked in the in the top fifteen. The WBA. Not that that really Hang matters. On. They'll just shove him in. Hang on, I'll check it out. So he got. Uh, Interesting, he's not even fucking ranked, according to fight news anyway. Um, I didn't see him ranked with any other bodies either. Well, that's what I'm saying. Zoiga's, Zoiga's on fight news ranked as having one of these WBA straps, but Smith isn't even appearing in the nope. rankings. F- fucking Eddie loves a WBA title fight, though, eh? Him and the Sirlins and that. It's nice to be fucking backhand, nice to be deal, nice to be fucking but a gram in the toilets, but a pure, but a. Oh, good shit, man. <laughs> Talking of non appearances, James Joyce was asking on the Facebook page Has the guru become civilized? Has the game tamed him? Where is he? Where is the guru? <sighs> Get my heart, mate. He goes. I think he goes away to work every week and he comes back at the weekend and just decides to go and get fucking bladdered there. Eh? And they probably, about, to be honest, he's probably been a casual now. He's probably not watching anything the new. He's he's no kind of keep myself up to date and all that sort of stuff. So he was just kind of pop out of Twitter here and there. And, but in fact, but never mind, Tommy. Where the fuck's Kurt? He's meant to be off on the holiday now. But the fuck is he? If I can help the troops out. We're missing <laughs> dangerous Dave Lee's working. Smido can't make it. He got married recently, so send your congratulations to Smido. Um, he didn't want anybody to know about it because, but simple <laughs> fact is, he did, he, did, he, did, he did turn up the night. I'm just going to let him know that he got married a couple of weeks back, so maybe the, the wife got him under the, under the thumb. So, just at Smido11, just let him know. Congratulations, Smido, on getting married. Um, in a couple of years' time, you'll be kind of. And actually, if, if you send a tweet uh, congratulating him, uh, you know, like the basically the winner will get a free signed uh, you know, item from the asylum. So the more tweets you send, sort of the better your chances are. You get a signed betting slip off Smido. A winning <laughs> one. They're very rare. A losing betting slip. The one he, the one from <laughs> the one from win. the one from Tyson Fury. <laughs> <laughs> all my money. The fight's not money. going the distance. <laughs> Wasn't Seb supposed to be coming on tonight? And people are disappointed. They want more Seb. Oh, yeah, yeah I've yeah. seen some comments on the YouTube chat that they wanted Seb on and that, but. Seb's, uh, I believe he's, he's, he's balls deep than he, he told me, so can you do? Plus, anyway, if, if he was here, he would be talking about spear jabs and fucking leaping hooks and that right now. We'd we'll still be talking about fucking Baron well, Hawkins. <laughs> we're going to bring a spear jab of the year award in honour of Seb whenever we go on to our uh, awards very shortly. I keep saying that. Final three points. First of all, Nick Blackwell update. I think he's train, a, a, a trainer was suspended and... Yeah. And Kakadi, a light heavyweight, was also suspended for the sparring incident. 
Yep, good news. Uh, you just wonder what the fuck they were doing, eh? I don't know, Ken, maybe, maybe Blackwell felt good. Maybe he felt he'd, he could handle the guy or whatever and that, but you just, you just, you didn't fuck with the brain. You just, they're taking the big enough risk as it is, but to have a brain injury to go back in the ring again like that, I mean, you just, you know, the brain's a final frontier. Nobody knows what goes on in there as such, you know, so you can't just open it up and have a quick look at it. Oh, you're fine, mate, and stitch it back up again, can you? So, no. think, think before you blink, mate. Fuck's sake. Think before you blink, says Andy. Donny, I don't know what you know about Ray Vargas, but he's def he's fighting for the WBC title against Gavin McDonnell. I cannot believe Gavin McDonnell is anywhere near a world title shot. This is a crazy world we live in. Seriously? Apparently so. They may as well bring out Gavin Reese again. I like no, The Rock. I like The Rock, actually. He was a good, could be an exciting fighter to watch. He had a good fight with uh, Andreas Kotelnik. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Donny's jumped off he's no interest in my question you know what I can't really blame him final point Andy let's get you in on this one Hazumi Hasegawa retired I always enjoyed his fights back in the day good wins over Vetieka Malajotu a massive WBC world bantamweight title reign that went on about 10 9 or 10 fights in a row before he got sensationally knocked out by Fernando Montiel he was later knocked out by Johnny Gonzalez and Kiko Martinez a real good boxer puncher in his day Hasegawa I mean, I as you say, he's coming up. He was he was a really good, exciting fighter to watch. Uh, the Montel victory, I remember being quite surprised with, uh, especially with, with him travelling for it. Obviously, then Gonzalez. I think th those were quite quick knockouts. Actually, I think uh, the Gonzalez fight was quite early. And obviously, Martinez is obviously hitting you know, the form of his life at that time. Um, and the people at that point were kind of saying, you know, Hasegawa should have retired at that point. You know, if you look at the for 2010, um, he only well. He was out for the best part of six months, and he was out for a year after that, and uh, kind of fought a couple of a couple of times that year. But uh, he kind of thought, so like after Martinez, he was just kind of like you know stand aside after that. But you know, he come back, he beat Ruiz, you know, made him retire at least. You know, if you some people will remember Ruiz when he fought um, Cocky, sorry, he come. Oh, fuck's his name, Cocky Kameda. Um, like yeah, he, that was yeah, that was it was Cocky Kameda. Yeah, uh, that's right. I, I remember. I think I remember briefly watching that fight, but I, I think I remember gave it to Ruiz. Uh, Ru, sorry, Ruiz winning that fight with one fifteen, one thirteen. Uh, I think he then did he get knocked out pretty? Was it not an early knockout against? Is it is it Seha? Huli, that, that name rings a bell. Huli Seha. Uh, I think he then he won the he won the title back actually off uh, off Seha. I think it was, and then obviously he got beat off Hasegawa. So it was really good to kind of see him win the title again, and obviously go in his own terms. So uh, fair play to the guy. Yeah, Hasegawa got three wins towards the end, including a win over Horacio Garcia, who we saw, and then Hugo Ruiz, as you say, retired him at the end. Johnny's, uh, Johnny, Johnny, who's Johnny? Donny, in fact, has jumped back on and joined us just in time for our yearly, it's more of a yearly discussion than a yearly awards, because I wanted the whole panel on really to give out awards and stuff, so and we've got the Bell of the Week coming up right at the end of the show, so we'll have plenty of high quality awards to give out let's, let's go on to uh fighter of the year first of all guys i'm gonna put lay my cards on the table on for Carl Hampton, wins, over, wins over scott quig and um leo santa cruz now look i'm just gonna say fighter of the year fighter of the year knockout it could be at any level right. World level it could be domestic level just just throw out whatever the hell you want right i, I put a uh uh what do you call it? I poll it on Twitter and I put up Manny Pacquiao's name, Carol Frampton, the winner of Kovalev Ward and any other fighter. <clears throat> I've seen some guys put up Joe Smith's name. Um, personally, I wouldn't go with it as such. Uh, I can understand the argument that maybe Frampton can't get it because Scott Quigg's shite, uh, but he did travel and beat Santa Cruz. <laughs> you know, he did travel and beat Santa Cruz and, you know... Manny Pacquiao at the same time, I don't care what anybody says, you know, fuck, it, fuck anybody I actually think differently about this, but he this year beat Bradley, who was still a top 10 rank pound for pound, and he then beat Jesse Vargas, who by most rankings would probably class a top 5, top 6 welterweight, he picked up another world title, so you can, you know, I can understand people maybe want to vote for Pacquiao, but um, I've I've got to go for I've got to go for Carol Frampton in my opinion. Um, I just think you know, obviously the, the quick the quick fight the quick fight was shite, but he did what he had to do I suppose considering the, the weight problems or whatever. Uh, but the Santa Cruz fight, ah, that turned out to be the fight I'd hoped it would be. And uh, see, to be honest, actually, I would probably be inclined to say that's maybe my fight of the year, 
you know, you could, no such, but I forgot another fight of the year, but that was a really, really good fight. And I'm really pleased uh, that the both guys delivered, actually. And uh, I wasn't surprised to see Frampton uh, win that fight because, as I say, I had that bet on Misebo in that fight for over three years, always convinced that Frampton would beat Santa Cruz. What do you so, think happens in the rematch, though? Um, I think it was a close fight. I think Frampton could probably share that again. Uh, if we get fair judges, but I know it's in his neck of the woods as such, so I think if we get fair judges, um, he'll do the business again. I think Santa Cruz might shade it, like you say. If it's a close fight, I think they might go for him this time. But Dave, definitely, Carlos for me. Yeah. Carlos for me, fight of the year. Yeah, Carlos for me as well. Dave, I was listening to the HBO Boxing Podcast the other day with Eric Ratskin and the other lad. And they were going, oh, Terence Crawford and Lomachenko. Now, obviously, they're HBO fighters and I have to go with, with the house. But, I mean, would you go for a Crawford or a Lomachenko? Could you make a case for those? Or would it have to be like a Pacquiao? Or, I know you don't like the jack-off. Lomachenko, no. Crawford uh, has a shout because that postal win is very good. I think underrated. But the other two, what was it? Um, obviously, Molina and then I think it was Lundy early in the year. And uh, they don't cut it. Um Frampton, I, I just think Quake. Say, Dave. Just, Say it, Dave. Go on. No, you want to get to Frampton. No, get them. No, no, no. Get them. Quake, Quake is just too bad for me. And that mean, that that gives Frampton one good win the year. A, a fight I had a draw, but I, I mean, I, I expected it to be um, a lot more cl- clear for Santa Cruz. So. You're going to see a war, aren't you? <laughs> now be patient, Andy. Um, so, for, <laughs> all credit to Frampton for that big win. I've it's, been, it's coming. I'm not the fighter of the year, no. Uh, the fighter of the year had the best single win of this year. Mm-hmm. And uh, whether it, it all depends on how you score that big yes. mega fight. <laughs> I fucking knew it. Um, you could easily give it to Kovalev. If you think he won that fight, give it to Kovalev. Because that's an amazing achievement. Um, beating a guy who's not, not beat since he was 12 years old. Beating an amazing top pound-for-pound fighter in Andre Ward, which he arguably did. I think Ward won it by a point. I'm going to give it to Andre Ward. I think Andre Ward's fighter of the year. Also, Sullivan Barrera. Um, we're not Paul going to talk Smith. about... <laughs> Paul not, Smith? No, that wasn't this year. We're not going to talk about Alexander Brand. Well, that was the one. Brand, that was the one, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, Sullivan Barrera is a good, good, solid win. And of course, Kovalev, big, big win. Um, I'm going to give it to Andre Ward. See, I didn't, I didn't want to bring the two into the equation. Simple fact is I had Kovalev in the fight and obviously I didn't think Ward won it, so I didn't want to bring up A2 because obviously it's just going to create a bit of debate. I just think that, you know, obviously Frampton's went away from home, you know, done the business of, you know, against a, probably the top top fighter in that division, actually, probably that time. So. And against Quig, he was, I mean, it wasn't really unifying, but it was a grudge match. He was going away from home as well. We didn't Domestic rival. We didn't to be so shit. Domestic rival. He was. Yeah, who did you go for, Dave? Did you go for Ward in the end? Ward, way better than little Frampton. Shit. Okay, really what's, what's that guy's name again? And fucking, what do you, what's that program called again? The Wire. The big black guy goes, shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I respect your opinions, Dave. What about Donny? Um, are you a objective voice here, Donny? What do you think? Yeah, I, I can't go for Frampton because I really didn't rate Quig that high. I mean, the, the, Santa, uh, the Santa Cruz win is good, but uh, I think that Pacquiao has to be in front of uh, in front of him. I think that, uh, like Dave said, I think Ward uh, is in front of him, and I think also uh, uh, I think Crawford is too because the postal win, uh, in my opinion, uh, was very very impressive. Uh, and uh, Crawford was favored going into that fight, but not by a lot, uh, and he totally and completely dismantled him and stopped him, uh, and that was a that was a, a, a supreme uh, a victory right there. So. Um, yeah, you, you know, your push comes to shove. I'm, I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with Pacquiao. I think I think Bradley and, and Vargas are are uh, are better than Quig and Santa Cruz. Uh, and so for those for that reason, I think I can very clearly identify him as the fighter of the year. Okay, we've got all, some diversity uh, here. Yeah, diff- differing voices, different opinions. That's what I like to hear. Don't don't let it ever be said that we don't do research on here because I've been keeping a little running list in my Google documents all year of uh, the fights and the knockouts and all that have been uh, that have that have been the best and I've been remembering them. So I knew that come the end of the year I wouldn't be able to recall who'd done what and who'd knocked out who and all this. So I have a little list of fight of the year in front of me. 
Okay, right, we've got Thurman Porter, we've got Salido Vargas, we've got Chisora White from the other week, Tom Duran against Luke Keeler, and my personal favourite that I'm going to vote for, Jamie Conlon against Anthony Nelson. That was a brilliant fight. It happened to be ringside by pure chance because James Tennyson was fighting on the card, and Tennyson's manager paid for a few of us uh, flights to go over to the show. So it happened to be ringside for Conlon Nelson, and it was as good as a fight as I've ever seen. And I've been to a hell of a lot of fights over the years. Really, really enjoyed that one. Uh, Donnie, we'll go to you first. What about fight of the year? You're probably not going to say Conlon and Nelson, are you? But what's well, you know, to be, I was just going to ask you about that. I was like, what, is that uh, who, um, who were the first names of those fighters again? Jamie Conlon and Anthony Nelson. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, I'm just writing that down. I want to. I want to watch that because I didn't. I, I missed that. And uh, if, if it was uh, Jamie Conlon yeah. is uh, Michael's brother. You know, Michael. We talked yes, to him last. Yeah, week. Yeah, we talked to him last week. Yeah. Yeah. Who are you going for? Uh, well, I mean, I, if I haven't seen that, actually, I mean, maybe I would go for that um, if I had seen it. Unfortunately, I missed it. Uh, but um, had uh, winning was clearly Salido Vargas. Uh, I've seen all the other fights that you mentioned, but I just haven't seen that other one. So I feel like I um, shouldn't be voting. But um, but yeah, but for right now, my, my leader is, uh, is Salido Vargas. Yeah, you can vote for whoever you want on it. It was a shame that Salido Mura didn't come off, wasn't it, with Salido getting injured? Yeah, yeah, it was. That was a shame. That would have been a really good one. Hey, to Dave, what about you? Fight of the year, all good suggestions. I didn't see that Nelson won. Uh, Nelson uh, Nelson versus the brother. What's his name? Jamie Conlon. 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 Yeah, Nelson Conlon. I didn't see it. I'd like to see it, though, because uh, I like I like Conlon, so I'd probably like his brother. I hear he's a crazy person in the ring. Um, I... I think I'm going to say Chisora White for me, heavyweights going at it. And it was great to see Chisora in shape again. They both went for it. I think Chisora won that fight. Um, but yeah, it was good stuff. I, I, I'm going to say that fight would be my fight of the year. Nice uh, unexpected drama to close out the year, which wasn't as bad as I thought it was shaping up to be. A turn. I think uh, Kovalev War deserves a shout for fight of the year too. I thought that was really good. A technical standpoint. Yeah. And it was dramatic. I mean, it was hugely competitive and and had um, various momentum swings. Yeah, I suppose, Dave, if you're putting in Chisora White right next to Kovalev Ward, it shows the nuance of the sport, the, the different polarities between those two fights. One was just right. both of them were knackered and they were throwing wild swings, and that was exciting, whereas Kovalev Ward was always very tense on a knife edge. Someone could get dropped at any point, probably Ward. It, yeah, it was far from a slugfest, but it was, it was just so competitive and it was so important. Andy, you've already mentioned Frampton Santa Cruz. Are you sticking with that one? Um, what about that Buglioni fight for last week? That was a decent wee scrap. I wouldn't say it's fight of the year yeah, material. Was, yeah. Maybe a comfy behind one of the year, I suppose, if you want to, want to uh, put that on it. Um, what about, uh, yeah. I was going to say uh, Yamalaka against Moreno, the rematch. That was a decent wee scrap. Um, that was a decent wee scrap. Uh, Vargas Salido, it was a really good fight. I mean, I think it was over a thousand punches thrown in that fight, but I, I would probably need to go away. Um, uh, Conlon against Nelson, uh, it's probably going to get it. It's not going to get it right across the board. It'd be nice to see the lads actually get the get the fight of the year. But that was that was a really really good fight, Jimmy Conlon, Anthony Nelson. That uh, the one we we didn't mention, I think, was uh, Chocolatito versus Quadras. That was quite a hell of a fight, and right down to the wire too. Uh, I suppose. Any heavyweight fights anyone could think of? I know we've said Chisora White, but I was just trying to think on 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 a higher level. I mean, it's been pretty much. One-sided stuff. Well, for the AJ, he's he's fought fucking bin cans. Uh, Klitschko's no fought for ages. Uh, Wilder's been injured. He's got that Spilka knockout, which will probably make the list for a KO of the year. Uh, yeah. Hilarious shite. Duhafis got knocked out. Pavekin's a drugs cheat. Um, Baby Miller, didn't see much of him. Sloth Mitchell, who Donny proclaimed to be the next pound for pound kings. <laughs> fucking on welfare, it apparently. Good heavy there was a good heavyweight fight, but I can't remember off the top of my head what it was. I just remember at the time, or might might have been last year. The years start to merge into one. Whenever you get to to my age, um, Parker Tam. It wasn't fight of the year, but it was. Ah, uh, no, it was all right. No, I'm not going to put that in. Anyway, I'm just rambling. Any other comments on fight of the year before we move on to knockout of the year? OK, 
Okay, right. I'll throw my list in, Andy. I know you have a, a monumental list of, of entries. You'll probably duplicate a few of mine, but that is absolutely fine. Let me throw out mine first. Uh, Hassan and Dams on Saturday night. Indongo of Troyanovsky. Jorge Lara's KO of Montiel. Wilder Spilka. Alexander Gavozdik, second round knockout of Najid Mohamedi. Khan Canelo and Mason Menard knocking out Yudi Bernardo on Showbox. A few obscure ones and a few more yeah. well-known ones. I've got a couple of there as well, mate. Just, you've mentioned a couple of them, but I've got... Who's on there? Donnie, still wanking in the background there. You're on a horse. <laughs> uh, aye. Right, OK. Uh, and Dongo, as you said, mate. Uh, guys I have against Jordan Schimmel. Uh, just, that was the fight he knocked to the guy with the left hook against the ropes. Uh, Canelo against Amir Khan. Uh, Bell U against Makubu. Callum Smith against Luke Blackledge. Uh, that was last week, I think, that one. Uh, Joe Murray against uh, that, uh, was he called Rashid, Kas- is it Rashid Kasim? Oh, it yes, was, I forgot about that one. That was in Denmark, wasn't it? In Denmark, aye. Uh, Sergio Freyas knocked out uh, Victor Chene. Uh, Adonis Stevenson against Thomas Williams. Uh, I, thought, I was going to make a mention this earlier actually. Thomas Williams could actually be a winner of this award or he could be actually involved to uh, get knocked out but he obviously got knocked out against Adonis Stevens and they knocked out Edwin Rodriguez so uh, Robert Easter Jr. against Ogie Mendes uh, Eric Molina against Thomas Adamek remember that one? Oh yes, yes uh, obviously Charlo against uh, Williams was a, was a good knockout uh, Martin Geffen against John Wayne Hibbert Good trade and the I think the other obscure one that I got this this was was actually pretty sick. Uh, Cesar Barra is it Barra on video against Azel Cozoyo, uh, pretty brutal knockout. But uh, out of that list, okay. I'm gonna have to go with Nandam. Nandam, that last one. Then Dam, then Dam against Blanco. It's just it's just the it's just the way it happens, eh? But I really want to get the can also, eh? <laughs> Donnie, are you gonna give it to Khan? You know, I hate to say it, but I, I mean, well, actually, I, have to, I haven't seen the end on thing from last night yet, but uh, but I got to say, that has to be the knockout of the year is uh, is, is Canelo with Khan. I mean, you know, I mean, he, he, we literally, he was out before he hit the floor. Uh, if you look at the slow motion, the, the snot uh, from his nose actually, like, like, flies out of it. You know what I mean? Have you, have you seen that? <laughs> have you seen that, that visual uh, slow-mo replay? Yeah. It's pretty disgusting, actually, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, but, uh, but in, in boxing, and particularly for this award, that's kind of what you're looking for. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, just in general, I, it might have been one of the worst knockouts I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, and, um, you know, and then and then having that uh, sort of iconic photo of, of Kenny Bayless waving his arms over him uh, when he shows no response to the count, uh, I think is, uh, you know, was a, at first it was pretty chilling because we were hoping it was okay, but... But afterwards, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, that has to be the knockout of the year for me. I disqualify that bullshit as for my candidates because, one, I disqualify people I don't like, which means Canelo and Adonis are both disqualified. Two, it's a light heavyweight or at least a super middleweight smashing a welterweight. I can't, I can't give it to something that has no meaning really to me. I mean, what, you're going to put Vlad against... Put, put put Vlad against Andre Ward. I mean, what do you expect? You're going to get a freaking knockout. So I'm disqualifying it from my list. For me, Julius and Dongo, uh, just because I want to rep Af- um, Africa. Troyanovsky, rest in peace. No, I was I was vicious, like. That was a rough one, wasn't it? There's been a few good ones this year, actually, I think. Considering that the fights have been shite, uh, the knockout's been pretty impressive. Yeah, that that uh, J Rock knockout was. You see, boss, I, I, I watched that. That's I watched that Smith Blackledge knockout the other night. They're actually in slow motion. She, she has she has a whole body posture. The way he got that left hook in at that shot, man, holy fuck! He was rooted right to the spot there, Smith, when he lucky landed at that shot. It was a fucking quality knockout. It was a belter, wasn't it? Okay, we'll move on to one that was suggested by our friend Sean on Twitter. He says the card of the year. <laughs> one of the Russian ones, Andy, maybe. They do put on good cards over there, don't they? Uh, aye, as such. I'm trying to think off the top of my head, actually. It would probably need to be one of the ones that would be involved with Lebedev. But what's he had on this year? I'll just double check. I actually hate it's it's a shame that we're giving this award now because, you know, usually those Japanese, Japanese cards... 
at the yeah. end of the year, usually pretty stacked, yeah, for New Year's Eve. It's just the amazing Japanese, actually. We've got that guy, remember, Corrales, he kind of, he kind of fights a kind of similar style to, like, Rigo, he maybe knocked out Ujiyama, he's got a rematch with him coming up. Let me put him in to knock out the year as such. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. That might be that card there, mate, actually. Uh, is it? No, it's not that one. It's one where Lebedev the knocked card? out. What about... Yeah, the Russian card when Lebedev knocked out Ramirez, wasn't it? The Argentinian um, card? I'm looking at that one now. Ah, yeah, that's what I'm just kind of looking at. But I was, there was one I had that was quite a few upsets on, actually. It was, obviously, the guys I have won uh, had three upsets in that one. Uh, remember the Kalinga? Have a quick look at the Kalinga one here. Eh, nah, I can't, I can't figure it out, mate. I mean, obviously, all the casuals listening will probably go, oh, one of Eddie Hearn shows or Joshua fights. No, I, I really don't know. I mean, eh, show of the I year. Think, I think that um, Golden Boy always put on pretty good cards. I mean, if you're looking at, like, say, for example, the one that was on last night, you had Hopkins was on it, Rod, uh, Diaz was on it, Bigley was on it. Ustik was on it. I mean, it's not brilliant stuff, but there's four decent fights. Then you've got undefeated guys on the undercard who are against... Paul Cow was on it as well last night, wasn't it? and stuff, yeah. They're not bad cards, are they? I know people have to pay through the nose from them on HBO. It's, it's all relative, isn't it, really? I suppose it's better than some cards we get over here, but, you know, what constitutes, you know... What was the question again? The, the best card? So, obviously, the fights that you're talking about. Best, best card of the year from top to bottom at any level, I suppose. I mean, Frank puts on stacked cards, but they're not... They're, they're actually got Flanagan against Orlando Cruz on there, and they're not really that competitive. I think the, the Golden Boy won last night. At least they were competitive fights. To be fair, Frank, no, there was a couple of cards he put on this year. Okay, they weren't great, but he had a couple of good undercard fights on there, actually. Okay, obviously, it was at kind of similar level, so to speak, but decent, decent enough wee fights. Um, but nothing really like, rings a bell or sticks out to me. I mean, obviously, you know, we did it in Manchester in February, and that was it was good banter and stuff, but uh, as, as for an event, that was, it was terrible. I mean, you had fucking Gavin McDonald fight on that card that almost put us to sleep. I had the worst hangover, like, not believe that day. And uh, watching Gavin McDonald fight, holy fuck. It uh, doesn't help, does it? Okay, well, part card of the year and go on to trainer of the year. This is another one I was struggling with. The one that came into my mind, I suppose, was Shane McGuigan because he was having consistent wins at a, a relatively higher level. I know the David Hay fights weren't really the best and all that, but you had Groves, you had Frampton. Uh, it doesn't have to be on a world level, could be on a domestic level. One guy who I won't be vo- uh, volunteering forward for fight, uh, trainer of the year is Freddie Roach. I mean, uh, Freddie's really pissing me off lately. He's just t- turned into complete mercenary. He just appears in every single corner. I know that boxing's his life and all that, and he wants to make money, and I appreciate all that, but it just there's no quality control with Freddie these days. He'll just go with anybody. He's a mess nowadays, mate. It's all, about the, it's all about the Benjamins. How about that postal performance? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And half the time, he can't. they can't even speak English. He's talking to a translator. They can't get the message across. He was with Quella, wasn't he, last weekend? He was in the corner with somebody this weekend. He's also, he's, also, he's also got that wee Filipino guy in his corner. I, I know he's appeared in the camp like a couple of years back, and that, but I've never really kind of seen him training in fighters. Now. I don't know nothing about that guy. Marvin Simodio, right? That, that guy, he, he, well, he kind of took over for uh, uh, Provodnikov, didn't he? Is that what it was? Yeah. Uh, because he had to be somewhere by fucking Pacquiao was it no China the, uh, he was fighting Rios in China I think at the time yeah yep any other nominations uh, Virgil Hunter maybe Tesco Joe Animal Shagger John David Tesco Jackson Joe. we'll give it to him anyway especially after last night Tesco Joe will be moaning that he doesn't get the credit he deserves you know because he's had all these great wins this year it doesn't matter what happened to these fighters <laughs> in the ring Tesco just nominated for trainer of the year every year for no reason Paul Smith, uh, sorry, Liam Smith got knocked out. Uh, Quig got schooled. Burton got, like shit. Burton got knocked out. Uh, Crawler, don't forget Crawler. Crawler got defeated, uh, uh, outclassed against Linares. Uh, so it's been it's been a good year for Tesco, Joe, actually. You know, it just shows you, you, know, you, should, you should be deserving again of that Ring Magazine award. Just think, to it, like, who you for? Just think at some point he's going to be... A, a, inducted the pantheons of the great boxing trainers like Angie Dundee and Whitney Bimstein and all that sort of stuff and Jack Black, Jackie Blackburn and all that. Eh? Can he wait? I know we didn't really do much this year, but our old man Don Charles, we saw how the difference, which is all with him, gets back with him, gets into shape, puts on a great fight. You know, it's respect worthy. 
Yeah, Chisora with Charles is like that sort of Anne Wolf James Kirkland relationship. Sometimes fighters just have a trainer, don't they, that they click with and bring the best out of them. And that's certainly the case in that relationship. Uh, Donny, do you have anybody you want to throw in? Joe Gallagher. <laughs> <laughs> Tesco Joe. Who's, who is, is, is uh, McGuigan, Frampton's trainer? Yeah, Shane McGuigan, that's who I went for. Right, yeah, I think I could go for him too, even though I don't think Frampton's fighter of the year. Andy, who are you going for? Put us out of our misery. <sighs> Surprised you didn't go for fucking what a Virgil Hunter there, Dave. But uh, well, I mean, because I think it's more due to Ward than him. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. I suppose. Unable Sanchez. <laughs> unable Sanchez. Uh, no, I, I think Shane McGuigan's a good shout. Actually, that's that's a fair one. Whoever uh, Crawford's trainer is too deserves something. Um, I don't know who it is though, oh, so I can't name him. I can't remember what you call it. Yeah, I can't remember what you call that guy now. Uh, oh, you know what? Doesn't Angel Garcia. Anybody? Angel Garcia. Yeah. Why not take a Salka? Right. Let's move on. Uh, if you have any more categories, throw them in at the end. I'm going to throw in a few of my own categories now just to finish this off. Knobhead of the year. I'm going to go for both of the Eubanks. They've really pissed me off this year. They just talk shit. They have a, a, a elevated self-worth about themselves they're just completely delusional and every time a decent fight comes along they don't take it and they knob it of the year mm, the, as i say they're on the list is long but distinguished uh tesco's up there paul smith's up there spencer's up there uh andre ward could be up there um why andre ward just these bitching and stuff like that now but this rematch yeah oh yeah yeah fair enough um you banks are really are taking the piss, so they really are taking the piss. But uh, no head of the year. I'm going to go for Canelo because this is the way he's basically made us dance along to this fucking tune with Golovkin and that people are going to be, oh, it's business. Not, I don't give a fuck about business. Make the fucking fight. Keep, stop fucking leaving us hanging here. Make the fucking fight. So I'm going to go for that wee fanny bleed Canelo. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Dave, who are you going for? Don't forget, we've got Lawyer of the Year coming up, so don't put all your eggs in one basket. Oh, better watch Donny. You better get the retainer out there, mate. We're going to have to fucking get... <laughs> um, <laughs> so, knobhead of the Year. This is certainly not to defend the Eubanks. Jimmy Cox. Jimmy Cox as well. Not to defend the Eubanks and certainly not to defend Canelo, who I, I despise both of those. But uh, this is for Pavetkin, knobhead of the Year. He just, he's almost... He's almost... Uh, turned Andy completely off the sport, busted up the Wilder fight, popped again. I mean, put people's lives at risk. I hate the piece of shit, and I want him destroyed. Um, th this guy I hate more than David Hay right now. Oh, that's saying something, Dave. Donny, knobhead of the year. You can't vote for any of us. Oh, okay. I was going to say I can't go for Patterson. I'll be glad I'll take, I'll be glad I'll take, take the award, man. I'm fucking happy to be called a knob. I'm glad I'll take that because I'm, I'm, the same, I'm the same at work. That. See, see I, I put this face with it, work on that. He basically says, don't fucking talk to me. I'm on the social at work and I can't be bored with human beings. It's just a complete and utter fucking helmets. Hate them. Especially white uh, people. I can't stand white people. Uh, on, so I think, I think uh, it'll go for... Um... Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I think Canelo's a really good one, and I, you know what, I think I'm going to go for that. But I was between him and David Hay, uh, just for uh, number one, the uh, the sideshow Bob haircut, <laughs> and number two, the uh, or I'm sorry, the SpongeBob haircut, excuse me. Uh, and then uh, and also for his, um, you know, just continual uh, fighting of of absolute no hopers, just taking the piss out of people, selling out arenas, uh, you know, for for absolute farces of fights. Um, but you know what? Hey, if he's making money doing it, at least I can understand that. But Canelo bringing Golovkin in the ring uh, after knocking out Amir Khan and saying, oh, yeah, he's next, he's next, and then dropping his belt and not fighting him for, uh, you know, uh, it's gonna if it happens in September, it'll be over 18 months. Uh, to me, that, 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 that's, the, that's, just, that's just pure knobhead material and, uh, and clearly enough to, to get him over the finish line here. 
Excellent stuff, Donny. I believe our friend Dave the Hater Lowback has to disappear very, very shortly. So we're going to fly through these. Uh, I think Andy believes we might may be heading into litigious deep water with Liar of the Year. So we'll say Liar struck bullshit merchant of the year. I'll go for Eddie after his uh, Anthony Joshua would end Eric Molina in three rounds. And then after that, he was caught on video. He tries to sell the fight. Aye, tough later. fight. Tough fight, aye. Liar or bullshit of the year, Andy? Uh, mass, oh, as I say, you've got to be careful when you're calling folk liar nowadays because it costs Steve Buns a house when they fucking call Mickey Duff a liar. I remember uh, um, talking about that, he was really bad about it. But bullshit of the year, definitely got to be Eddie Hearn. He says, you know, I, 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 you need an extra, I mean, another four hours to basically talk about the amount of bullshit he spoke this year. Um, the, the, remember the old bait and switch as well? Remember he fucking pulled that off at some point? Uh, I forget mm-hmm. what fight it was. And who was it? Eubank, Eubank, and who else was it? Who the fuck was it? Wasn't the Jetta fight, was he? Oh fuck! There was a couple of bait and switches he pulled this year. Actually, uh, just does not fucking sit in my mind, any bastard. But aye, bullshit. There's got to be Eddie, man. I mean, this is there's multiple, multiple crimes now. We need CID to investigate the fucking shit that he talks. And plus, <laughs> I seen some comments on Facebook yesterday actually for Ron Glazier talking about Eddie Hearn. Ooh, shit balls. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, I'm very device. tempted to nominate Eddie as well for his numerous, um, you know, the selling Santa Arabs um, tactics he uses. He's he's very good though. He's very good at his job. I have a lot of respect for Eddie, um, even though he does annoy me sometimes. But I I, I do like him as well. Um, but now I'm not going to vote for Eddie because I've got to vote for Billy Joe Saunders. Um, some of his excuses may hold some water. Most of them, I believe, do not. The point is, I don't care about excuses. He's not he's not producing. And he promised everybody he was going to be fighting in September. Not even close. I'm going to go with Billy Joe. Just had about enough of him. He's, he, he's really dis, um, destroyed his career in many ways th- without even being in the ring and just talking a bunch of shit. So, yeah. Dave, before you run off, who are you going to go for a spear jab of the year? The person in boxing you'd most like to smash in the face with a well-timed spear jab? <laughs> oh, good question. I'm going to go for David Hay. And that'll be it for me tonight. I have to go. I have to go uh, entertain some folks, but uh, good show. Have a good rest of the show, guys. And thanks for listening, everybody, this year. I'm out. Thanks, Dave. Good night. God bless. Best, mate. Cheers. See you in the year. Donny, bullshitter of the year? Has to be Oscar. I think it goes hand in hand with uh, the Canelo uh, nomination we just gave before. Smack with the spear jab. Uh, hmm. Probably David Hay. David Hay's getting a double jab. Andy, I'm going for Spencer Fear on my old sparring partner, even though he doesn't quite know it. <laughs> what award's this for me? What award's this? Spear spe- wants to smash in the face with a well timed spear jab. Uh, O'Hara Davis for calling but us boxing fans uh, was it mutants or trash or something like that? Mm, something like that, yeah. Last night, uh, either him or the Eubanks or or Broner. Can I go for Broner? Can, can, can I get a, a, a couple of nominations for this one? So I want triple for, jab if you want. Triple want, jab right hand uh, or left over oh, the triple jab right hand followed by a left hook finish. We could do that one. So yeah. I want to go for Davis, Broner, Stevenson definitely. Um, Frank, you know, who was the other one that fucking pissed me off recently? You're Pavet- right. Pavetkin. Spencer doesn't really bother me that much. Okay. Uh, who else? Um, Pavetkin, I mentioned. Broner. I mentioned Broner. Uh, Broner. Canelo. Fucking prick. Right, any other notable mentions of any categories or anything? It's it's not getting any better, is it? Our fight of the year review. Any, any notable mentions, shout outs? No. Nine. Okay. Yep. Nine. Just... nine. Oh, oh, so no, sorry, mate. I was just, just stretching there. Sorry. Right. We're going to get the bell you of the week out of the way very quickly. Well, we've got the two guys on the line about 10, 15 minutes to go. And then we'll, we'll scoop up our final questions and then we'll jack on out of here. Let's get on the way with the bell you of the week, guys. Uh, nomination for Jake Conway, first of all. Chris Eubank Sr. announced the broadcasting brand that is ITV will catapult talent as far as talent can go. 
and with Chris Eubank Jr., that can be stratospheric. Where do you think you and ITV will take Junior? Congratulations on securing an amazing platform such as ITV. Chris Eubank Junior, excellent work, sir. <sighs> Bloody hell. Nomination for the Eubanks themselves. This is going to, uh, Chris Eubank Senior, Andy, says that mm. on pay per view is going to sell seven or eight million buys. Steve, you can just stop talking, mate. Just give the award right now. That's it. <laughs> done, done and done. By the way, where did you get that, that quote? People were asking me about that last night. It, it was on Facebook, and, and the, the people who put it up said, bear in mind, Mayweather Pacquiao holds the all-time boxing record for 4.6 million pay-per-view boys. Ah, and that's right, and they mentioned that uh, they mentioned that Fox Groves did all, like, over 1.2. I think it did slightly less than that, actually, but I remember Hatton Mayweather doing like, something like 1.2 or something, 1.4. Got 8 million, fuck's sake. I mean, Christ, he, he, he rings. People are going to stand up and fucking pay... I don't know how much you're going to be paying for this pay per view, but eight million, so two million less than what? How many is fucking? No, I was more than that. I say he's fought in front of seventeen million, wasn't it? So I mean, come on, fucking think about it. How many is that <laughs> fucking fought free TV in front of seventeen, eighteen million people? And he believes people are going to pay fucking box office to watch his son against some fucking Aussie no mark. Piss off. It's not going to happen. Andy Pops has put forward our friend John Foy, who says, "Imagine he review it thirty years old. He'll be like Ali." Nomination <laughs> for Eubank Jr. for the Money Talks uh, meme that he did on Instagram, putting the notes up to his ear, Mayweather-esque. Yeah, Money Talks. Okay, fair enough. Nomination for the Stig. Uh, Ozil Gummidge, our friend sent this in. I'm not really quite sure what the Stig was saying, so sorry about that. Nomination for James DeGale, sent in by Ashley the Zulu. Only 30 days till my fight with Badu Jack is on, and he tagged in Sky Cricket <laughs> on, on on Twitter for some reason, and Ashley has nominated him for Kit Kat tagging. I'm, I'm not really sure what Kit Kat tagging is, but it doesn't sound doesn't sound too ple pleasant. Maybe that's one for the youngsters amongst us. Um, nomination for Tony Bellew. What's next, Tony? Well, says Tony, it depends what's on the horizon. It'll be crazy because I'll be the best cruiserweight in the world and the best heavyweight in the world outside of the champs when I beat Hay. Bye, right. Not the best cruiserweight in the world, Tony. For a start, where do you go with, it, with a statement like that? You didn't, you didn't go anywhere, but I think it's still not going to beat Eubank, mate. What about, what about, a uh, oh, fuck, did he call him again? Harun Khan getting his cock put, uh, put out on Twitter, or Instagram, oh, that's what it was. Well. He's on Poor the list bastard. as well, so is Amir Khan. Amir Khan says, extra bulk and I'd have taken Canelo out. Aye, aye, aye. Nomination for creepy Thomas Savage. He keeps sending photos of himself to, um, isn't it Michelle Phelps? Isn't that the, the name of the girl? Yeah, Michelle Phelps. And he, he keeps sending photos of himself to her. That's a bit creepy. He's getting into guru territory, Andy, with the creepiness. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, yeah. He did, didn't in time he do the same thing. <laughs> I don't know if guru was sending pictures and that, but again, he was kind of pestering her for a wee bit for a, a, you know, a drink or a meal or you know, a sticky finger or something like that when he was over there. <laughs> John Swan has nominated Dave the Hater Lowback. He's disappeared, but a double nomination for last week for proving to be a casual. Uh, Dave asked Michael Conlon if he'd met, ever met Bob Arum. I did laugh about myself, uh, to myself <laughs> about this one at the time. And then he's only now noticing that Burger King is Joseph Parker's sponsor. So a double nomination for the Hater. <laughs> uh, our friend Joe O'Neill from IrishBoxing.com sent this one in from Chris Sutheran. He said, my Christmas tree's up with a signed AJ glove and me, me star missus isn't happy. But it's the best star about. He's put a signed AJ glove at the top of his tree, Andy, instead of a star. Sad human. I wouldn't even call him human, actually. I would call him an absolute sicker fan, actually. That's, that, that's pathetic. See, to be honest, see if I had my missus. My missus would have been fucking bananas at that, by the way. If, I, see, if I'd done that and I went out somewhere, I'd, I'd have been taken down fucking without me even noticing it. Fucking sad, sad man. Fuck <laughs> sake. Well, Paul Smith might have got himself a world title shot, but he's been nominated here for talking about world class. He says, Joe Selkirk is bang on. People get confused with world level and world class. There's a world level a lot will reach, but fewer ever world class. Is there any irony in that Smith, uh, comment, Paul? Like you, for example? <laughs> <laughs> this is a good one. Uh, did anybody see the video that uh, Charles Martin put up? He proclaimed Aye. to walk the earth like a god, and he was absolutely stoned off his nut. I'm going to put my big fucking Bob Marley reefer in his mouth, eh? <laughs> Tremendous. That man knows how to party. What about Scott Quigg? He's, he's got to be on the list, mate. Scott Quigg's got to be on that list. What's that for? You remember, he was tweeting people with, with a fake account, talking about his mum's yeah. shipping and all that sort of stuff. Account? Yeah, that's Quigg. Yeah, he's on the list as well. 
Uh-huh. We'll put okay. him on. Harun Khan, you mentioned that one, Andy. He's on as well. Harun Khan, I, I will be. Uh, yep. Amir's busy then because she's she's going to cause eruptions and all. She's already done it, I suppose, but she's going to cause absolute fucking drama in that household. Like, we'll put her on. Nomination for Martin Murray. I don't think he's to blame at this, but apparently there's someone on Plenty of Fish dating website dot com who's pretending to be Martin Murray. Paulie Stevo. <laughs> Paulie Steve, I was trying to get a date by putting up all pictures of himself as Murray. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdo. <laughs> um, nomination for Paul Kingy. He says, at Eddie Hearn, one thing the British public don't appreciate, Eddie, you've put on eight hours of class boxing for £17. It's amazing. Tony Bellew lodged up AJ's arse. Joe Fournier is nominated for calling out Callum Smith. The WBC be been nominated by Kurt Ward for naming Vitaly Klitschko eternal world heavyweight champion. <laughs> eternal. They named him eternal champion. They gave him an eternal championship. <laughs> How much did he pay for that one? Don't know. <laughs> That's a bit ridiculous. Gary Holiday, first time at a live fight since Tyson versus Francis. This AJ kid will become the greatest of all time. Oh, dear me. We're getting through them, guys. Daily Mail, who said that AJ knocked his opponent out in the fourth round instead of the third. Jeff Pearl's probably asleep by that point. Tyler uh, emailed HBO Boxing and Dan Raphael saying, Eddie Hearn knows how to put a card on. HBO could learn a thing or two from him. Oh dear, I bet they could just go on our weed rendition of Sweet Caroline, Fat Bitch. I right, no thanks. Did you see the video, Andy, of, of Sweet Caroline and they were all punching each other in the crowd? Aye, right, right. Yeah, but I, I remember seeing a, a, a couple of pictures, or still pictures actually, of a Frank Warren show. Holy fuck, man. Teeth like raw condemned houses. And one last year, they had like a, a set of fake lips and that she got to suck their apples through a letterbox way. You know, it was absolutely <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Another nomination for Chris Eubank, Trailblazers and Game Changers, and then he tagged a load of people, including James Corden, for some reason. That was brought to my attention. Scott Quigg, we've already gone through Quiggy. That's it. I'm not going to bother reading back through them. I'm just going to say I'm voting for Charles Martin. Who are you going for, Andrew? Eubank. Strong week, actually. Yeah, strong Eubank. Week. Eubank or Eubank. Just senior for that 8 million comment. That was absolutely fucking horrendous. Yeah, for me, it has to be Eubank. Yeah. Eight million pay-per-view buys. I mean, I, I don't care. People are saying it's like nine ninety nine. I've seen four ninety nine getting thrown about, but I, I ain't paying for that shit. There's no fucking way I'm paying a tenner for that. I wouldn't even fucking go across the road and watch that fucking fight for my house. I tell you who would pay for it, Andy. You know who I'm talking about. Oh, Dave Lee. I know. Dangerous Dave Lee. Can the reason why he's not coming on the night, Dangerous Dave Lee, is because he's actually kind of wanting to go to bed early doors to watch the wrestling the night. What's on the night, is it? It's this December. Is it Survivor Series or something like that I've got in the night? Oh, I, I don't know anything about wrestling now. Oh, fuck's sake. Anyway, we'll give it to the Eubanks. Well done, guys. It's funny. Survivor Series is tonight. And last night at the Hopkins fight, we got to see the Royal Rumble. Oh, great. Shoot me now. <laughs> you know where they have to... You, you win by throwing them out of the ring. Aye, it's all set up beforehand and that. <laughs> Here, Donny, do, do you think if Hopkins had got back up again and, say, at 25, 30 seconds, had clambered back into the ring somehow, what do you think they would have done? Do you think they would have invoked the 20-second rule or try and brush over the carpet and let him carry on? Um, I mean, if they're following the rules, no. Because, I mean, Jack Reese started that 20 count the second he fell out of the ring. If you go, if you look oh. and watch the replay at a different angle, like, he started the 20 count. He, you know, he knew what was going on or whatever, and he even yelled down, don't help him, because you're not supposed to assist him, you know, getting back up. I, I think that he would have followed the rule. Yeah. Right, a few questions to finish off, guys, and then we'll finish. Thank you for staying on, Donny and Andy. John Swan, Andy, do you think Eddie Hearn might use the AJ Vlad to set a new standard, a preview fee for the UK? Say I that question about against this you. Myself. Donny's do fucking about in the background that... there. Sorry, Donny. Do you think that Eddie will use the pay-per-view uh, Joshua Klitschko fight as an opportunity to charge a higher fee? So say it would be a £20 pay-per-view or a £25 pay-per-view. You know, it's a big fight, uh, isn't it? We're going to have to take it up in price. Eh, well, see, John Swain asked that question, right? Okay, John, didn't he, didn't he even ask that question again, mate? Because if you put that idea in Eddie Hearn's head, he will fucking try his best to do it. So... Yeah, I, I wouldn't be. Well, obviously, I wouldn't be surprised or shocked if it happened. People will obviously be outraged about it. Um, 
it's a pay per view fight as such. You could probably say it is, but you know, nothing should be in pay per view. You know, that's just it's the way it is. Um, nah, I think it will stay the same. But if you give Eddie Hearn, if you give Eddie Hearn enough rope, not hang yourself, but make a fucking dollar or two, he'll take it. And if you give him that suggestion, and Sky are happy to implement it. Yeah. You know, that's this is the thing. If you just look at some of the shit that Adam Smith and that kind of tweets out and all that sort of stuff, and Johnny Nelson and all that, so you just never know. You just never know. It's not. It's not really twenty, right? Seventeen quid. Seventeen. Sixteen ninety-five. Yeah. Oh yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, if they kick it up to twenty for a fight like that. No, I wouldn't be surprised either, Donny. Um, back onto the shady world of drugs for you. Um, not because you're into the PEDs or anything, but this is a question from my friend, Ruby McGonigal. It's a, it's a pretty good question, actually. He says, Donny, do you think that the promoters are partly for blame for fighters taking drugs based on the fact that they keep giving cheats opportunities? For example, Ortiz and Beltran were fighting on big shows last weekend, despite both recently failing tests. Galahad has worked with the country's top promoters since his ban, and Tarver still has a job with the PBC despite failing two tests. Maybe if promoters started shunning cheats, they might think twice about taking the risk. Yeah, but they won't be if there's if there's money to, to be made. I mean, right? I, you know, if the fighter is talented and he's you know, or if he's popular or or both, um, you know, I mean, they're gonna they're gonna want to promote his fights and and make money. I mean, uh, I, I don't think though that promoters like encourage the taking of PEDs though, because I mean, while they want to have guys who are talented at the same time, you know, a fight gets called off and you you know. You, know, you had your arena, your tickets, your pay per views, everything that, that fucks everything up. You know, uh, I mean, they it definitely costs them a lot of money, and so I mean, I, I think they don't want their guys to uh, to get uh, popped for PEDs. But you know, coming back off of a ban or something, if there's a if there's a market to work with them, then they're going to work with them. They're not going to shun them. Excellent stuff, Donny. Andy, a question from Richard Swig on the Facebook page. This is a Hall of Fame question, so listen carefully. So with Hopkins presumably bearing out on Saturday and Andre Ward sending non-committal on a rematch with Kovalev, it may be possible, depending on the timings of retirements, that we end up with Floyd, Manny, Roy Jones, Hopkins, Andre Ward and Vlad all coming up for the Hall of Fame first ballot in the same year. If that were to happen, which which three would the panel go for on the first ballot out of those? Floyd, Manny, Jones, Hopkins, Ward and Vlad. Floyd, Manny, Jones, Hopkins, and Ward. And Vlad. And Vlad. Yeah. Right. Uh, the Hall of Fame. You could maybe even chuck Gonzalez in there, actually, because if he maybe chucks it the next year or so, you never know, but it's five-year eligibility. Um, I'm going to go f- for Floyd, Manny, there without question. Absolutely, without a doubt. If, if they're all retired, say, right now, it's Floyd, Manny, and I would probably... Go with Hopkins. Yeah, me, me too. Yeah, probably go with Hopkins. Really? Yeah, I just think you know he's, he's... John. Jones is a great, great fighter, but it's it's just I just think it's maybe the the, the opponents that he's faced. I know Hopkins is his middleweight run, isn't he? All that tremendous, not sort of stuff. But you know, he kept he kept going, and he finally got his reward in the end. He beat other top fighters. You know, you, you can maybe even see Hopkins and Jones is interchangeable as well. I mean. He's like heavyweight run that for Jones wasn't he all that great though. This is the thing, he went up to heavyweight, done the business, but he picked on the weak, the weakest champion. I have any problem with that. Okay, he's a weird guy going up and weight. But uh, you know I'm kinda of getting semantic about it, but I, I just think Hopkins, um, considering he, he knocked out maybe somewhat green Glenn Johnson. Um John David Jackson was a good fighter. Uh, Andrew Council was decent, Simon Brown was all right. Um, Carol Diamond's fights weren't all that great, but then you know Antonio Tarver, you know, good fight. Pavlik was uh, currently he was a uh, you know the lineal middleweight champion. Um, I've pulled the records up in front of me just now, just to kind of pick through Jones's and stuff. But I just think uh, Hopkins is maybe stands up better. Mm. You're selling it to me. I'm going to drag up a few questions that we've had over the previous weeks that we haven't managed to get to. We'll go till quarter past and then we'll finish it up, guys. So if we keep it as quickly as we can, we'll get in more questions. Donny, question from James Joyce. With Rigo calling out Lomachenko, he was at the time, does the asylum think this fight will happen? And if so, at a cat, at a, at, oh, at a catch weight and who wins? Rigo, Lomachenko. It only happens at 126, but don't worry because it's not going to happen. No. Um, no, I mean uh, the you know Lomachenko's not interested in him. 
uh, and Rigo can never, you know, see me and they get a, I mean, I know he always has issues with those fucking idiots down in Florida, those kids that Caribe promotions or something. Or, oh, yeah, yeah, but they, yeah. Said, but they sold out with him now, so they're used with Rock Nation, I thought, right? So, no, nah, but he's still with Caribe, though, I'm sure. I'm pretty sure he is. They, as yeah. long as they yeah, have a piece of him. Pardon? Contracted to them, Donnie, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, yeah. I mean, anything they're involved with is always a disaster. Um, you know, I mean, I'm hopeful uh, also to the fact that Rock Nation has just blown like a lot of money. Like they lost money on the Ward versus Kovalev fight because they, they signed Ward to such a huge contract. They owed him a lot of money. And they also, uh, the reason why they're putting Co- Kirkland and Cotto on pay per view is because they owe uh, Miguel Cotto at least $11 million. And, you know, obviously H- that's not in HBO's budget. They're not going to pay that. So they're just hoping to try to uh, basically mitigate their losses a little bit, you know, without, I mean, they're going to lose money. It's just a question of how much. But I mean, you know, I don't know if they're going to be willing to put the financial backing right now uh, behind uh, Rigondeaux, uh, especially since he's not, you know, a you know, particularly marketable fighter. So, uh, you know, there's that. And then there's also the fact that I don't think L- Lomachenko is interested in the fight. So, um, bollocks. But, yeah, Bollocks, he'll fight him. Rigo is the one that's ducked fucking Lomachenko. I, I, I believe him when I, when I seen the video with the subtitles and stuff that he, it, I think there was a contract or offer made and I think the sticking point was about the weight. I think Rigo wanted a catch weight and Lomachenko has been absolutely resolute on this 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 issue. There is no catch weight fights. None. Zero. Yeah. Neither. So you can fucking forget about it. That fight is simply not happening. If it did happen... Considering, I know Rigo's a you know a great fighter and all that sort of stuff, but Lomachenko is fresher, younger, and all that sort of stuff. So I would probably need bigger, to go with him. bigger as well. Yeah. Eh? yeah. Okay, we had a question for me from Billy Ed. I'm just I've just lost it a second, so I'm trying to bring it back up again. Steve, if you had a sex change and were allowed to box, could you win a world title? Um, I'm going <laughs> to say no. Fucking I'm question. Say no. <laughs> Because I was useless boxing as a man, and I don't think I'm going to be any better boxing as a woman. So no, Billy, I'm going to say that I probably wouldn't win a world title. Um, Just bringing up a final question. This is from Ben Thorns. Right. Who in the panel's opinion is guilty of the worst quit in boxing history? I'll go with that idiot that fought Tyson after his incarceration. Can't recall his name. I think he means Peter McNeely. Worst quit in boxing history? The worst quit in boxing history. You could probably put Duran in there, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Didn't um, want to say it, Andy. Ah, uh, well, I've got to kind of try and be some sort of kind of impartiality, you know. But worst quit in boxing, uh, Arturo Gatti. What? Was pretty bad. Arturo Gatti's quit against against who? Life. Oh, that's fucking disgusting. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm joking. Uh, uh, Cotto, obviously, against Margarito. That was a disgraceful quit. He could have stood up and took it like a man. Instead of that, he went to live on his knees. What was the Ortiz quit that he done? Not Madonna. He, was a, he did another quit. Ah, he, got, he got his job broken and he says, I don't have to be taking this. Okay, then get the fuck. No, 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 no. He, he, said, that, he said that after the Madonna fight when he didn't get his job broken. He just... He just was getting beat up and uh, he just said, no, that's it. And he was he was actually ahead in the fight, if I recall. Was it, okay, it was the crash fight. Was it the crash fight he got his, his jaw broken? It was one of the fights he got his jaw no, broken and he was, quit. Uh, it was Josecito Lopez broke his jaw. Is that what it was? All right, yeah. okay. Right, I can't end on that note, Andy. I'm going to have to ask one final, final, final one from George Atwell for you. If Salvador Sanchez's life wasn't cut short, where do you think he would have ended up in terms of greatness? Did he have the uh, the ability to surpass the likes of Willie Pep and others? Absolutely. Uh, if you go back to the Punches of the Past episode for what fight did we cover? The Zuma Nelson. Um, I did state a, 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 list of, a, a list of fighters. If he had lived, he could have went through. I would say he'd probably have maxed out at one three five probably. So, you know, the fighters that he potentially could have faced, you know, great fighters, Bose Edwards, Chacon, uh, Chavez, Ramirez, fucking who else we got? McGuigan, maybe McGuigan might have been too... Too late, I think it would be too late for Sanchez. I think he'd have moved up by that point, actually. So you maybe got yeah. Pedroza in there, uh, Rocky Lockledge, Tiger Lopez. I mean, there were some great, excellent fighters around about between 130 and 135. Arn Pryor, uh, Arguello, you know, it's you know, it just dripping off the tongue, man. I mean, he could have had rematches with these guys. We're talking about a rematch with Gomez at some point. 
Juan Laporte was getting a rematch against him. He was a good fighter. He finally won the world title. So, um, absolutely, I, I did mention that it was, you know, I wouldn't say he'd be probably a top Sugar Ray Robinson's record, but I think he would have probably breached the top 10 of all-time greats if he'd have lived and kept winning. And he didn't need to win every fight. He didn't never won every fight, but he could, have, he could have lost a couple of fights and won the rematches. It wouldn't affect his greatness in any way, shape or form. He would have fought everybody. That was the thing, wasn't he? He wouldn't have ducked anybody. Exactly. But look at his record when he was champion. I mean, eight defences in what? Was it 18 months or something? Maybe even slightly. It was lesser than that, was it not? It was, it was a phenomenal fighter, absolutely true. I, mean, I, I suppose the only knock on him you could actually maybe say was he's slightly a slow starter and he could be open to, uh, I think it was the right hand he could be open to. But, you know, he was 23 year old. He was he was close to being the complete package and it, is, it was just tragic he got taken away from him. But, you know, it's just sad. that it, Maybe some people think we maybe over, overrate him because he died so young after achieving so much so, so young in his career. But, you know... The greats all die young, I suppose that's what they say. But if he'd have lived, he would have been definitely been a top ten all time great if if he'd have kept fighting. Because he wasn't going to keep fighting, he was going to retire as well after the apparently after the Laporte rematch, he was going to retire and try and become a doctor or something like that. So you just never know if he might have lost him to anyway, regardless if he'd lived. Excellent note to end on. Yep, from what I've seen of Sanchez, he was some hell of a fighter. Thanks very much, Randy. Thanks to Donnie as well for being on. It's been great stuff tonight. Day of the Hater Lowback was on, and Amir Khan jumped on as well. Don't forget to go over to BoxingAsylum.com. There's blog posts and all sorts there. The forum's supposed to be coming back. Tommy actually wrote a blog post today on uh, the Bernard Hopkins-Joe Smith Jr. fight, so if you want to go over to BoxingAsylum.com, you will be able to pick that up. Thanks for listening throughout the year. It's been a long old year, but we got there in the end. We'll be back in January. I'm not sure of the exact date. It has been talked about behind the scenes, but we will be back at some point. Do not fear. Have a nice Christmas. Happy New Year. All that type of stuff. Seasons beatings, jingle brawls. Couldn't think of any more boxing related festive puns. So we'll get out of here. Cheers, guys. All the best trips. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year.